I'm good. You started? Yeah, that's fine. Good evening, folks. Yeah. I'd like to thank everyone of you for showing up and coming out to join us tonight. Uh, if y'all don't know me, I'm Tony Ash. I'm the acting president of the FOP right now. Uh, I just want to introduce my board. If the board would stand up, please. This wouldn't happen if it wasn't for these guys here. Y'all give me a round. Thank you. The monitor tonight's candidate form is going to be Al, Keata, <laughs> charter member of the FOP Lodge 81. He served various positions within the lodge. He's been Sergeant at Arms, Vice President, Treasurer, and President. He retired law enforcement officer for a total of 34 years of service. Retired from Cape Coral, Florida Police Department with the rank of Deputy Chief. He's a graduate of the 163rd season of the FBI National Academy. He's also attended 12 seasons of the Administrative Officer Management Program conducted by the NCHP in Raleigh, North Carolina. He's selected by his classmates to be class president. He was selected to assessor communication accreditation law enforcement agency traveling agencies in the U.S., Canada, reviewing rules, regulations, training, and standards, documenting meetings, the standard established the commission by the commission. The certificate is closely watched and must be reviewed every 10 years. He's led his agents through two accreditation qualifications. He's worked close with citizen groups, established neighborhood watch and business programs. Uh, he met with the Board of Education of Lee County, Florida, launched the School Resource Officer Program for Cape Coral in the early 80s. I also served eight years with Lee County Steering Committees, which was adopted by Lee County's School Board. Lee County Sheriff's Office. This is including interviews and selections of officers for programs. Would y'all give me a round of applause? Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate that. Uh, I would appreciate your attention throughout the course of what we're going to be proceeding through tonight. There are five eligible candidates here that are all looking to hopefully one of not hopefully, they're all hopefully, hopeful that they will be the one that's elected. And it's up to you people to make the decisions, but we're very glad to see you here and we're glad that you're disinterested. So therefore, I'm gonna ask each one of the candidates to stand up, no, before we do that, because they're gonna be giving order, getting orders all night. We've got some general rules in regards to how this forum will run. The candidate will introduce himself in a two-minute period of time giving a brief statement regarding his background and the qualifications he possesses which is applicable to the position of Macon County Sheriff. At the close of the forum, candidates will be given a two-minute time frame to give a brief summary of their goals and objectives. The candidates will respond to questions submitted from this, from myself, which has so we sat down last evening with the board members and went through and selected the questions that would be asked. Uh, there will be a total of 15 questions that we will be presenting directly to the candidates. They will have a two minute period to answer each one of those. But every one of them is gonna answer 15 questions. They're gonna all answer them in diff with different responses. So no candidate. Our candidates, uh, excuse me, no individual, individual will be permitted to shout out questions or blurt out anything from the floor unless you're asked to do so. If you're asked to respond to something, do so. But no questions, just running rampant through the whole format. <clears throat> Only the FOP members submitted questions <coughs> directly to this board. Now. That was through solicitation with people that were making comments that were contacting various officers within, that are within the county and also the FOP Lodge. And we were the ones that held these questions. Last night, we met and we took it down to 15 totals. And we are believing that this format or this, this program, the way it is, will probably run until around nine o'clock, maybe a little bit after. 
So, the, as I say, we're going to control the board member. Uh, the board members will be controlling what takes place out on the floor. No shouting or other unruly outbursts by anyone on the floor. And anyone who can't follow these simple rules will be immediately asked to leave the room. So basically, that's the way it's going to work. And I hope that you listen closely, attentively, and that the candidates we have have the answers that you're, you're seeking. So, with that being said, we're going to let candidate number one, Mr. Holbrooks, Brett Holbrooks, stand up and introduce yourself, sir. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Brent Holbrooks, and I'm your candidate for Macon County Sheriff. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming out this afternoon and the FOP for hosting this event. Um, folks, I'm a husband, I'm a father, and most important, I'm a Christian. Uh, my wife is here with me this afternoon. Um, we've been married for 10 years, and we're happily blended with six kids. We're also members of the Cowie Baptist Church. Um, I have faithfully served Macon County for 22, almost 23 years. Um, uh, I started my career in 1999. Yeah, I did leave for a short period, but I, I returned. Uh, in 2010, I was promoted to corporal, and I saw the opportunity to come over here to, to the courthouse for courthouse security and civil process. Uh, and I did that in 2014. Shortly after coming here, I was promoted to sergeant, and then uh, just uh, last year in 21, I was promoted to lieutenant. Um, I take great pride in, in uh, working for the sheriff's department. I've also been on the I was on the SWAT team okay. at around 15 years, and I also did undercover undercover drug buys in neighboring counties. Um, with all due respect, guys, all, all your candidates in front of you today, I'm the most involved with your youth. End of story. I've served on two different sports boards, the baseball and basketball board uh, here in the county. I coach football, basketball, soccer, and baseball. That's my passion. That's my commitment is our kids and moving, moving Macon County forward in a positive direction. Thank you. Candidate number two. Guys, I, as, as Mr. Holbrooks had stated, we greatly appreciate the uh, wonderful turnout that's come out tonight to support each and every one of us. Uh, my name is Derek Jones, and I'm a candidate for sheriff here in Macon County. For the last 17 and a half years, I've dedicated my life to this profession. I started with the Highlands Police Department in early 2005, coming to the Sheriff's Office, as a matter of fact, May the 2nd in 2005, and I've been here ever since. I started out as a detention officer here with Macon County. Uh, thereafter, I went to Road Patrol. In 2007, I was promoted to the rank of Corporal as a field training officer and had a part in writing the first ever field training officer policy that the Sheriff's Office has had. In 2008, I was promoted to sergeant. I served on the SWAT team from 2006 to 2011. In 2012, I put myself back through college and completed a Bachelor of Science degree from Western Carolina University in criminal justice. In 2015, uh, I, wanted, I wanted a change. I wanted to see different things about the, uh, the department. At that point in time, I'd, I'd started considering in the future running for sheriff, so I went to juvenile investigations. Uh, I worked in juvenile investigations for about a year and a half. I moved over to criminal investigations, and for the last eight to 12 months, I served in an undercover capacity working wiretapping cases from Atlanta, Georgia, back to Macon County, Jackson County, and surrounding areas in Operation Jawbreaker. In 2018, I was promoted to lieutenant, uh, took over as a jail administrator. Uh, over the last three years, uh, I've managed, uh, managed a budget, overseen many programs, many different uh, things have changed within the facility, and was promoted to captain in 2021. Uh, a lot of things I've uh, been a part of over the years, youth programs, elderly programs, you name it. I would say that we'll probably discuss that in further depth tonight, possibly. Uh, you know, we don't know what the questions are, but look forward to talking to you. and. Uh, I respect each and every one of them up here tonight, and uh, we're all in it for the same reason, and I believe that's the betterment of all citizens of Macon County. God bless you. Hello, everyone. Just like the first two said, you know, we're here because of you. We're here because of Macon County, and we all want to represent Macon County as the next sheriff of this county for many different reasons. I stand before you. I actually started my career out in law enforcement. Back when I was about 11 or 12 years old right here in Macon County, 
I went through one of the only sheriff cadet programs here in Macon County at that time. Um, our sheriff today, Robert Holland, was actually my mentor at the time. He was a volunteer for the sheriff's office back around that time period. He actually mentored me as a youth. I still have my sheriff cadet jacket hanging up in the closet today. I feel that the reason I'm standing here before you today is because of what I got to encounter and what I got to do when I was young. So my goal is, you've heard many of you have heard me talk about bringing the D.A.R.E. program back, or not the D.A.R.E. program, but the cadet program here in Macon County. Um, I look to do that if given the opportunity to become your next sheriff. I actually started my career out back in early 2000 um, after graduating BLET. Actually, right before I graduated BLET, I had two weeks of school left when I started working full time for your sheriff's office. I'll never forget the sheriff at the time called me into his office and told me, said, uh, son, not to put any pressure on you, but if you don't pass that state test in two weeks, I'm going to have to fire you. So uh, that's one of my fond memories of, of starting my profession. My 21st birthday, I worked 16 hours for the sheriff's office. I've continually worked my way up through the rank since then. I currently serve as your captain over patrol. Um, been running a canine program here in Macon County. Been part of the canine program since about 2001. Took over the program in 2012 and um, joined the SWAT team around the same time frame, 2001. In 2012, I took over as the commander of that SWAT team, and I am now the commander over a 12-man SWAT team. I train all our dogs in-house. I train dogs for about five different agencies right here in western North Carolina, and I would love to be the next sheriff of Macon County. Thank you all for coming out. May God bless each of you. Candidate Clay Bryson. Sorry. <laughs> The next individual is uh, Bob Cook. All right, I got to talk fast because I got about 20 more years to pack into two minutes. Okay, so my name is Bob Cook. I'm your candidate for sheriff. I grew up in Iowa. I was born and raised in a place called Newton, Iowa, a bit, about 30 miles uh, east of Des Moines. Uh, I have, I'm married. I'm between my wife and I, we have seven children. We have an even dozen grandchildren, and one more on the way to make it a baker's dozen. So I joined the United States Navy in 1972 to start my my lifetime of service. I uh, stayed in the United States Navy. I uh, started during the Vietnam War, and I graduated. I mean, I retired during the, the Gulf War of 1992. And I retired as a chief petty officer. Anybody here know what a chief petty officer does? It gets the job done. If you know anything about chief petty officers, the United States Navy goes to the chief petty officer to make sure the job gets done. So when I retired from the Navy, the last place they had put me was in Jacksonville, Florida. I had three daughters that were still in school, so I decided to go ahead and stay in Jacksonville, Florida, where I became a police officer. And I spent 22 years as a law enforcement officer in Jacksonville, Florida. In that time frame, I worked at a variety of uh, places. I worked in patrol. I worked in community policing. I worked in the gang unit. I worked uh, traffic officer. I was an evidence technician. I did uh, uh, property crimes, financial crimes, where I was the first uh, detective to investigate food stamp fraud in North Florida. And if you want my same hairstyle, let me tell you about that. Uh, it will make your hair fall out. I also did uh, the homicide unit where I worked where they did investigations for shooting. If you weren't dead, I had to come out and investigate. I also, um, I bought my first piece of property here. By the way, I spent 14 years in narcotics. Narcotics is my specialty, and, I, and I, uh, I've done everything in narcotics from buying crack cocaine, kilograms, to wiretaps. I bought my first piece of property here in 1999. I've been making county, part of Macon County since that time. I moved up here permanently in 2015. And I, I call Macon County my home. It's always been my home. I fell in love with it when I got here. And I, I'm going to live the rest of my life here just like I intended to when I first saw it. Thank you. Mr. Browning, you now have the floor. Once again, uh, my name is Chris Browning. And I would like to also thank the FOP for putting on this event, allowing us to come out and uh, answer these questions, give you more information about each one of us. A little bit about me. Uh, born and raised here after graduating high school. I went into the United States Air Force, served as a satellite commander for four years under U.S. Space Command. After I did my four years, I came out, came back home to Macon County, went to work for Sheriff Holbrook, spent five years working as a road deputy, and towards the end I worked as a sheriff investigator. Um, after I did my five years at the sheriff's office, I came out of that and went into business for myself. I've been in uh, private business, running two corporations for the past 17 years. So experience-wise, that's uh, combined with 27 years that I've got working and uh, experience-wise. Um, I know what it's like to 
to sign a payroll check and know what it's like to lead an organization from the top, having all the responsibility on, on you. Um, with this experience on day one, I'm ready to take over and lead the Macon County Sheriff's Department. And first thing we're going to do is um, bring an attack on drugs. We'll have more than one dedicated uh, drug officer as we have now. Uh, there's no way to fight drugs if you only have one dedicated drug officer. So there's going to be a lot of changes. That's what my platform is built on and change, positive change. Uh, look forward to working with all the great deputies and employees of the Macon County Sheriff's Office. Thank you. Now we'll come back down to number one candidate. And the question to number one candidate is, why do you feel that you are the most qualified to be elected to the position of Sheriff of Macon County? My passion and commitment I've had for all the citizens of Macon County. I, I am experienced. Uh, granted, I don't have a uh, college education, but I don't think you need a college education to know what the citizens need, to know what the youth needs of Macon County. It's to see a need, act on that need accordingly. Um, uh, that's it. Can you tell us who you are, please? She came in like, my name is Brent Holbrooks. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm Derek Jones. Thank you. Uh, same, the same question. Same, same question. I beg to differ. Uh, to be a police chief, you've got to have at least a Bachelor of Science degree at any agency that you go to. I know I applied to the Franklin Police Department, you know, and uh, made it down to the final four or five. Uh, Chief Harrell got that job and he's doing, he's doing phenomenal at it. Um, I believe that education is import important. You've got to know employment laws, procedural laws, any, uh, many other things that come along with secondary uh, formal education. Uh, I also believe that I'm, I'm the most qualified in the fact that I've worked all these other departments within the agency to better equip myself to, if you have a question about juvenile law or if you've got a question about domestic or drugs or whatever it may be, I've, I've hopefully got that answer. I don't have to go around and seek that, uh, seek that answer for you. Furthermore, for the last three and a half years, I was thrown to the wolves when I took over the detention center, and I've worked a budget for the last three and a half years uh, over the entire detention center. Uh, you've got a $3 million budget that I've seen that's been cut down to $2.5 million, and that's not because we just purposely cut it down. It's because we found ways to utilize money we already had and didn't have to ask for extra money of the taxpaying dollar. So, you know, there's many things that go into this. Communication skills. You know, I've always been active. Uh, you see me on the street. You walk up to me, I'll talk to you, I'll talk to you about anything known to man uh, for that matter. You know, I've always been actively involved within the uh, school systems, uh, been involved in many programs. I sit on the mental health board, I sit on the substance abuse task force board, and I currently sit on the uh, no wrong board as a vice president for support and recovery. So I believe that, believe with a wide array of background, the education, uh, communication skills, Many things come into play, and that's why I feel that I am the most qualified to be the next sheriff of Macon County. Clay Bryson, it's now your turn. And what do you I'm Clay Bryson, just in case, since I didn't get out the first time. Um, the reason I feel I'm most qualified for this position is to me, this isn't a title. I could care less about the title. Guys, I've done this my entire adult career. I started the day I turned 21. This is all I know is law enforcement. I grew up right here in Macon County. I'm raising a family here in Macon County. I've already got one daughter that I've raised. She's the behavioral health specialist for Highland School with a degree in psychology and a minor in education. Macon County is my home. And I have worked my way up through the ranks through the years here at the Macon County Sheriff's Office. I've worked in and around every unit with the Sheriff's Office over the years. Um, I, my passion has always been the drug problem that the next Sheriff of this county will be facing. First and foremost is the drug problem here in Macon County. I feel due to my training, my education, my background, you feel free to check out my resume, Clay Bryson for Sheriff. Uh, my resume is on there. I'm not going to go through um, everything that I have on my resume. Please feel free to check that out. But I do feel I'm the most qualified because 
like I said, the drug part problem here in Macon County is my passion. It's something I've always worked around. It's, I feel that I have the most knowledge in that area of, of over anybody sitting up here on this board tonight just because I've worked right here in Macon County for the Sheriff's Office 22 years plus now, boots on the ground. And that's my background. That's why I'm running for office and I appreciate your vote and your support this upcoming primary. Mr. Bob Cook. I, why I think I'm the best qualified. I have a number of experiences that, that nobody else on this board has. Of course, that's my virtue of me being a bit older. Uh, 20 years in the military taught me how to be a leader, taught me how to manage my assets, taught me how to do, how to make sure I get the job done. My time that I did as a police officer, I worked in almost every field that you can work into. That gives me a unique experience, particularly in the narcotics field, but we'll go into that in a little while. Um, I've got more experience in a variety of different fields than a lot of people do. I was on the DEA task force, so I know how it is to work with feds. I know how to, how to get better cases done. I know how to get uh, more complicated cases done. The wiretap is extremely complicated in the investigation, and it takes an awful lot of time to get one of those done and wrapped up. I, when, one of the things that I bring to the table is that when, when a detective comes to me or an officer comes to me and says he's done everything, he's tried everything, I can look at what he says, what he's done, and I can go, wait a minute, based on my experience and my training, I think you need to try this. One of the things that I, that, that I have an advantage of is I have worked in other areas. In other places and that gives me the advantage of seeing how things work around and not only around the country but I was a police officer on Guam so and so I've been able to see where things are done differently every place I go and I've been able to adapt some of the best things that I can into the into what I do and so what I've been able to do is, is think outside the box and make sure that when a, when a particularly, particularly difficult case comes up I can figure it out and how to get it done I've never failed on a wiretap investigation. I've never failed in, in most all of my other investigations. So one of the things, like I said, um, with my experience in management of personnel and my management, now I also didn't, I didn't have a $3 million budget. I gave you that. But those who hear it from my homeowners association knows that I did have a budget there. And one of the things you do with 21000 or $21 million, you don't spend somebody else's money that you don't have. You make sure you have the money that you need to spend when you have it. And you need the things that you need to buy. So I will make sure that I'm able to, to, to handle all the other things that come up because I've already dealt with all the things. Mr. Browning. Well, in this area, I feel like I'm unique, especially as I had mentioned prior in the experience area, because you know, I, I haven't spent all of my time working just law enforcement, but I have the different areas of experience over the past 27 years. It gives me a broad array of experience from the military, law enforcement, and my business experience. Um, business, I have, I'm prepared in that way, as I said before, because I know what it's like to be over something, not just over a department or something, but to be the top guy that's completely responsible, whether it goes good or it goes bad, it's on you. Same way with the sheriff. You're, you're the one that's responsible for everything that happens below you. You're in charge. And you better be prepared whenever you're in charge because the heat comes down pretty quick whenever things start going sideways and you got to get it back over. Um, it, it, and it, I feel like uh, in these areas, you know, we, we got to work together. We got to get back to working with uh, the other agencies out here. And we also, as Ben said before, we all know the drug problem is the main problem in this county. And uh, I'm ready to attack that. I'm coming in as someone that doesn't work there, and that's a good thing because I can come in with fresh eyes. I can look at what's going on. I can make the decisions. And not being from the way it's been done over the last 20 years, I can look at it freshly and make my decisions from that point of view instead of what I've been doing at the Sheriff's Department for 20 years. So in that regard, I, I, I think coming in, it's going to be a, a great change. I've, I've taken no money from my campaign. I've spent all the money running my campaign from my own pocket for the, the obvious reason. I can go in. I'm not bought. Uh, I don't feel like I owe anybody. Got none of that over me. I can go in. I don't need to pay a check, fortunately. I'm just going in to make the change. Thank you. Thank you. This question will be directed to uh, Mr. Jones, and the question will be, if elected, what do you see as the most important issue to deal with in your term of office? 
I think probably the most important thing to deal with in the term of office is uh, recruitment and retention. Uh, we know that in the law enforcement profession, uh, we see that a lot of people do not want to work in law enforcement anymore. Uh, it's, not that, it's not that it's not the glorious job. Uh, it's just all, the biggest thing that we're facing right now is the fact that law enforcement has taken a black eye every time we look in the media. I believe, secondly, obviously, is, is fighting the drug problem that we're going to be facing because if I stood here and I told you that uh, we're going to eliminate the drug problem tomorrow, I'd be telling you a ball-faced lie. Right. You know, but we're going, to, we're going to hit the drug problem. We're going to hit it full force head on. On the back side of that, we're also going to help those that ask for, ask for assistance because I'm a major advocate for substance abuse and uh, mental health treatment. But I believe, I believe those two go hand in hand, uh, dealing, dealing with what we're dealing with in the public uh, we don't work in the uh, most easiest of professions, and uh, not a lot of people, again, want to go into law enforcement. So, I believe one, we've got to we've got to get out, we've got to actively recruit, we've got to get those officers uh, that that want to be here. We've got to train them to the best of our abilities to put them out on the streets to provide them for the best for the for all citizens, and uh, we've got to uh, combat that problem and uh, put an end to it the best that the best way that we can. I would agree with uh, Mr. Jones. I think recruitment and retention is very important. Um, however, I hope that we've we've kind of taken care of some of that problem. Uh, we had that pay study back a year or so ago. Many of you probably seen on social media or read about where it did get our pay up comparable to other agencies here in Western North Carolina. In fact, it actually moved us ahead of a few agencies. So what was happening in the past, we were hiring new officers fresh out of school and we were putting them through an FTO program here in Macon County, which is about 12 weeks long. It actually started out, I think, about 16 weeks. Now it's down to about 12 weeks. But you put them through an FTO program, they spend about six months to a year here to get some experience and to go somewhere else to make more money. So that's hurt us. That's really been a downfall here at the Sheriff's Office. And that's something that we've worked hard and diligent in fixing. And I hope that we have, have worked towards fixing that issue. But I think the number one problem we're going to be facing here in the future is the drug problem that's currently going on. Um, right here in Macon County, you know, you'll hear people say we're going to stop the drug problem. You can't stop anything if you can't stop the source. The source ain't right here in Macon County, but we've got to deal with it effectively and swiftly when it gets here to Macon County. And there's ways I want to do that. I'm going to be revamping the drug program, uh, revamping the canine program, which I'm over at this point in time, but I want to combine the two to make a much larger unit to better serve the citizens of Macon County. And uh, that's why I feel like the drug problem um, is one of the biggest issues that we're going to be facing in the future. Thank you. Bob. <clears throat> Well, I've been walking around this county for the last year or so, and, they, and I've had two issues that are primarily given to me. Recruiting is not one of them. Although that's not that's, that's important, but the biggest two issues that I get are narcotics and patrol coverage. So because of my experience, I have the, the unique ability to really develop a case starting from the very bottom to go up. I've, I've gone as high as the guy bringing into this country. So I, I, I have the ability to develop uh, good uh, training programs for my detectives to be able to get the narcotics and start working on getting this narcotics program, program and our problem under control. So that's the first thing I need to, to work on is getting our narcotics issues to take address. And part of that is to uh, actually address it when you call. If you call the sheriff's office and you call a complaint about a drug house, typically what I'm hearing now is they don't ever answer it. And there could be a lot of reasons why they don't know that, but they don't they don't feel like they're getting an answer. So I will make sure that they get an answer on that. The other thing is to patrol coverage. I have a plan that's on my website, cookforsheriff.com, where you want to know if you live in Otto or in Nancy Halen or Highlands or any place else, you want to know how are we going to get coverage out there. I have a pretty detailed plan on how to make that happen. It can be done. It can be done pretty easily. I won't have to add one individual to my department, nor will I have to add any more money to it. So the two biggest things narcotics and patrol coverage. And I've, I've, I've gone all over this county and narcotics of course is the one they talk about the most and we will address that. There's, there's several different ways that I've got that listed on my, on my website on how we're going to address it. From, from a drug tip hotline, on a hard line, because a lot of people in this county don't have, they don't have internet, they have flip phones, I want to make it so everybody has access to it. I'm going to make sure that when we are out there in the areas that we're patrolling the areas we need to be patrolling because everybody in this county pays taxes. And I want to make sure that y'all get the services that you that you actually pay for. And I will make sure that you at least see a deputy out there in your areas at least patrolling around. 
Thank you. Mr. Browning. Yeah, well, I think it's obvious uh, we're all talking about the drug issue, and that will be the first thing we're faced with. Um, it never fails when you go out in the evenings, you drive out to see someone, to ask them for their vote, you know what they're going to tell you. Um, they're, tired of, they're tired of the drugs, they're fed up with the drugs, they're tired of the drug dealer that's been next door down the road for X amount of years, and it's still the same thing, and it's a nuisance that all the problems have come with having a drug house in your neighborhood. So that, that's number one, and you know, I have to go back. Uh, I left the Sheriff's Office in 2003. We had two drug agents at that time, dedicated drug agents. Then sometime after that, the Sheriff's Office went up, they had four drug agents, which was great. Now, at this present time, we have one dedicated drug agent. Now, that makes no sense to go from this up and then fall back down. That, uh, there's no way to combat drugs if you only got one agent. How do they handle from Mount from Hale to Hobbs? There's, it's impossible. I mean, it, it's hard for one agent to be working one case if they're dedicated to one case following uh, trying to work up a drug house or whatever they're working on. It takes a lot of time just for one agent. Well, then everything else is going on out here. So we got to get back to at least the minimum of four. Uh, the other thing is we got to get morale built back. Morale is huge. You learn that in the military. When you build morale, you start seeing things happen from the ground up. Your road deputies, they're working a lot harder for you because they, they feel good about their job, their boss, their supervisors, their chain of command. And that, that's another big issue that can be that can be handled. It doesn't take money. It just takes leadership. Thank you. Now me, huh? That's you. That's <laughs> me. No. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you have yeah. to answer it. Yeah. Yeah. So about a month ago, I did a video, and I posted it online, talking about how I was going to reach out to the surrounding sheriffs and try to reorganize a multi-agency narcotics unit. Um, I've taken a step back and I'm, I'm, I'm punting again. I want to reach out to the candidates in surrounding counties because from Haywood County all the way to Cherokee, there's more than likely going to be a new sheriff in town. So I'm reaching out, I'm starting that process and I'm reaching out. And the multi-agency agency narcotics unit is an agency, was an agency back in the day that was comprised of all of Western North Carolina. That's who I bought drugs for undercover. Um, I think that's imperative, and like Chris Brown down here said, we've only have we only have one drug agent for Macon County, and we have zero zero DEA assistance in Macon County. That's got to change. We can't combat the drug issues that we're facing today with no help, none whatsoever. We got to change that. You get to lead off, and your question will be. How will your administration observe due process of law, including the Fourth, Fifth, and Fourteenth Amendments to the Constitution? Well, I'm a firm believer in upholding the Constitution and what it stands for. And I think a lot of that comes through education. Can you, which can you speak up some? I don't know. Yeah. There's probably a lot of people back there that can't hear. You know, when it comes to our amendments and our constitutional rights, that's something we all have. And we're going to strive hard not to infringe on anybody's rights. You know, I'm a firm believer in upholding the Constitution. That's part of the oath of office that we as sheriffs take, is to uphold the Constitution and protect it at all costs. You know, when our federal government hands down um, things that they want us to do on a local level, we don't have to enforce mandates. That's going to be up to the sheriff at the time to make that decision on whether or not it's a mandate to be enforced. However, we do have to enforce laws. But I will, as the next sheriff of Macon County, do everything in my power to protect everyone's rights, not only in this courtroom today, but across Macon County. Um, going back to um, the drug problem, I'm going to touch on that briefly again here too. We do have a working relationship with federal agencies right now. I am the officer, the candidate that brought in um, Homeland Security here back several years ago. We didn't have a good working relationship with Homeland Security at the time. The guy that was over at David Magnets, he was the supervisor over Homeland Security at the time. We, made, we became good friends. They actually came in here and funded some of our operations, some of our interdiction operations, Homeland Security funded. So we have a TFO in-house now, which is a task force officer for Homeland Security. We also have an FBI task force officer in-house today to help on the federal side to get things accomplished. 
Thank you. The easiest way to protect all these amendments, first of all, is to make sure we know what they are. Is to make sure that our that our deputies are trained in, in what these what these uh, amendments are and how it pertains to the people that they deal with. As an archives detective, my bread and butter was the Fourth and the Fifth Amendments. Now, I had to make sure that I knew what all the changes were in the Fourth Amendment because it changes all the time. While they say it's kind of a living, breathing document, it kind of is because it changes depending on who the judge was that made the interpretation of that particular case. I will make sure, as I do now, because I teach narcotics at the police academy, I will make sure I know what those most recent changes are. And I will make sure that I follow the court decisions when it comes to this. And we have to worry about more than just our, our circuit court. Because if it, if it happens in the Ninth Circuit, we still have to be careful because there's, we have to know what, what those decisions are because they're going to affect everybody. Until the Supreme Court uh, weighs in on whatever it is, we have to know what these decisions are. So we have to train our deputies. And I, and I will make sure that our deputies are trained to make sure that they know exactly what these amendments are and, and make sure that their, that their reports reflect the proper procedures to protect these amendments and these rights. Like, like uh, Mr. Bryson said, I'm not the VAX police, I'm not the MAX, MAX police. I do not enforce mandates, but I do, I do enforce the Constitution of the United States. I have spent my entire life in support of the Constitution of the United States, whether it's in the Navy or as a police officer. I have sworn to uphold, uphold and defend the United States Constitution and whatever state that I'm in. So I will make sure that our deputies know what they can and cannot do. Nobody's going to come in here and tell me what I have to do when it comes to these kinds of mandates. It's not going to happen. Thank you. Mr. Browning. Well, this is a great question because this has been a whole lot of my campaign. A big part of it is uh, talking about the Constitution. Um, when you stand and you hold up your right hand and you swear to uphold the Constitution of the Sheriff of Macon County, the ultimate authority over law enforcement in Macon County, then you have to uphold it from, from beginning to end for everyone. Fourth Amendment, search and seizure, what these guys have been talking about already. Yeah, you got, you got to go through the process uh, as you uh, go through the arrest process. You have to make sure due process is upheld. Uh, freedom of speech, anytime you're confronted with that. All the different amendments and all the different rights that's afforded under the Constitution. That is your job. And uh, to treat everyone the same, you know. Make sure that uh, everyone is being treated equally, fairly, and making sure you're upholding the Constitution. Um, a big one for me, which I think is one of the most important, is the Second Amendment. Um, if we ever let the Second Amendment fail, then the rest of the Constitution, you might as well throw it out the door. Because the First Amendment's going to be next, and it's going to go on down. That's the goal. So as a sheriff, I have made this public many times. I don't care what it is, it's federal law, state law. They make some kind of law, which they would love to do, to try to come in and go around the Constitution to take guns such as red flag laws and those type of things that's another state. As this sheriff here, I will never go to anyone's house and under an unconstitutional gun law like that and take your guns. I'm not going to jeopardize the deputy's safety and most of all I'm not going to uh, go against the Constitution, violate the Constitution. That's one thing I'll stand on and go, and go to my grave home in this job is I look for the Second Amendment straight across. Thank you. Well, I, I agree with these guys, the ones that spoke. I mean, that's not only when we, when we go, when we become officers, you don't, not only take one oath, you take three. And that's, that's all constitution based. Um, I want to um, speak on what Bob said about the mass mandates and laws. And the vaccination. I think that's the most important. The, the the most que the most question I've been asked thus far is vaccinations. If it becomes a law, will you will you make your officers do it? And the answer to that is absolutely not. I'd highly encourage that because my brother-in-law, who was 42 years old, passed away from COVID. I'd highly encourage it. I vaccinated myself. I, and the 14th, the, the search and seizure, uh, we have that's that's big. There, there's a lot to the search and seizure, uh, and I'll, I'll and, and the Second Amendment as well. Uh, that's a that's the 
the second most thing I've been asked about is the Second Amendment. And like uh, Heston said, they'll take my guns when they pry them from my cold, dead hands. Thank you. Fourteenth Amendment's due process. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, as he said, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to be the mass mandate. I'm not going to be here to force a vaccine on you. That's your choice. It's your God-given right to decide whether you want to take it or not. Uh, my wife being a public health nurse and me being over the detention facility of 75 inmates, I decided to uh, be vaccinated because, I'll be honest with you, I couldn't go to bed at night knowing that if I'd have taken the, the virus in and 75 inmates gotten sick and they'd died, that'd have been on my hands. But uh, as most have already stated, you know, I'm a constitutionalist. I'm not going to. I'm not going to come in. I'm not going to kick your door in if I don't have probable cause or a piece of paper in my hand that says that I've got a search warrant and it's it's covered on all four corners and uh, justified in the court of law. Uh, number two, uh, I've, I teach concealed carry. What what better way to uh, instruct and inform the general public about gun laws and etc. Uh, so, Fifth Amendment, been a part of the Fifth Amendment for many, many years, working investigations, still do investigations within the jail. Uh, I teach legal update within the Sheriff's Office and within the Southwestern Community College. I teach criminal law, so I'm always constantly up to date on the law changes, anything, court, court uh, cases, case law that comes out. So, you know, we're very fortunate to have Southwestern in the backyard. We're very fortunate to have great instructors, and I take pride in instructing those instructors because I teach general instructor training as well and keep those up to date so that our officers respect and abide by the law and respect and abide by your law, the same laws that each and every one of us are given. So with that said, uh, I am a constitutionalist. I, I respect your rights, and I'm not going to do anything that, that is going to violate that at any time, period. You're ready. You're next. I started it. He started, started it. Okay. I missed you. Let me start with Bob. Bob, where do you stand on the Fourth Amendment, or the Second Amendment? Well, that's easy. Okay. I've got a lot of guns in my house. That's pretty easy, I think. Listen, I, I, the Second Amendment, like Mr. Browning said, that's one of our most important amendments. If that amendment falls, then so does all the rest of it. But I, I think they're all just about equal. Because the First Amendment falls, then we then we fall on the Second Amendment, the Third Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, et cetera, et cetera. We need to, we need to protect every single amendment we have. I am not going to do anything that's going to jeopardize the, the, the uh, possession of firearms. Uh, it, if you have a legal right to have it, I see no reason to interfere with that. And that's not me to make that decision. So the Second Amendment, to me, is something that we're going to protect at all costs. The red flag laws depends on what they are. Listen, red flag laws come up with, with uh, that's how domestic violence gets, gets flagged. That's how some of these others, mental illness gets flagged. We have to take a look. If nobody gets anything taken away from them without due process. There's nothing that's going to happen. It's like Mr. Browning said, we're not going to come down your driveway and we're not going to snatch your guns out of your house just because somebody said something. You have to have a judge that's going to make the order before we can do anything about it. The Second Amendment is paramount. We're going to make sure that there's no infringement on your amendments. But if we don't take care of the rest of the amendments, it doesn't matter. The Second Amendment is just something we're going to have to deal with as far as if we lose the first or the fifth. If we can't talk about what it is that, we're, that we, that's important to us, then we're going to lose everything. So we need to make sure that we protect every amendment that we have. So I'm going to be out there making sure that uh, anybody that they tell us that we have to seize weapons on, there has to be due process. It's not just going to be a he said, she said, said thing, thing that we see in some of these other locations. We're going to make sure that we have due process. Every individual in this country is afforded due process. Thank you. Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, the Second Amendment has been something I've been involved in for a long time, uh, probably two and a half years ago, somewhere in that time frame. As a group of us, we tried real hard to pass a Second Amendment resolution here in Macon County, like Cherokee County and a lot of other counties across North Carolina passed, basically saying that the sheriff would stand and uh, uphold the Second Amendment, not allow unconstitutional gun laws to be carried out, and the commissioners would sign on and back them that up. Just a statement to the public to let them know where the officials, the leaders of the county stand. We fought for about three months. 
and we have no success. Uh, commissioners fought us all the way, and you know we lost, but we showed up. We we did gain one thing. We let the public see what was really going on. Um, so in that fight, you know, I was the only one that was up here fighting for it, and. Uh, as far as the red flag laws, the problem there, I've read a lot on those, it is the due process. Um, somebody calls out a red flag and he says you have a mental issue or whatever. The judge issues papers, but they don't have to seize the guns. And the, the victim out here, the one that's getting the guns taken away, has no right. He, he never gets to stand before the judge until they come out and take his guns from him. So his due process is pushed out of the way. So there you go. Are you going to stand with the Constitution and reduce the to enforce such a law as that, or are you going to go out and violate that man's due process and take his guns from him? you got to make a decision. you got to stand tall and make a decision. And I've, I've made this promise once again many times. I'm not going to do it. And uh, if, they, if they can rework this law to where there is due process in line and it falls within the Constitution, then hey, we can work with that. But the way it is right now, you look at what's happened in other states, we've had uh, law officers actually die because of this and get shot going out trying to take guns. Well, I'm an avid outdoorsman. I love to hunt, love to fish, and I love my life. And I guarantee, if I go to Dave Jones or Jimmy Goodman's house, it's going to be a firefight. Somebody's, somebody's going to die. And I, like I said, I cherish my life, and I cherish the officer's life. And I will not, I will not go into nobody's house, crawl under nobody's bed, or search your closet, regardless who says a judge, the dang president could say it. I'm not coming to your house to get your guns. End of story. Are you sure? Guarantee. Okay. I just, I just wanted to confirm that. Okay. Um, without, without probable cause, I'm not going to come get your guns. Now, you've got to look at this by a case-by-case case basis. Um, I'm not going to believe in some he said, she said. There's going, to be, there's going to be a track record as to what has happened. Been part of many of those cases before where things have continued to pile up and over time you've got a list of different situations that the individual was involuntarily committed or you ended up having to be in a standoff with someone. Now you're talking about a serious situation here. Now, but to come up to your house and decide that, like you said, I don't want to go to Dave Jones' house or Jimmy Goodman or Justice Stamer or anybody's and decide to walk in and take your guns for, for no good reason. And that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen under my watch. I don't believe that would happen under anybody's watch. The key thing here is, is what has been articulated, what has went before a judge, and what's the probable cause for us to go in and take it. Plain and simple. That's the law. It's the law. Guys, it's hard to add on what's already been said here as far as the Second Amendment's concerned. I think all the amendments are equally important as far as the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, everything that our oath of office stands for. And I will protect all of that to the best of my ability. And talking about the Second Amendment particularly, I was born and raised right here in Macon County, so everybody knows that I've been exposed to guns over the years. I was also a concealed carry instructor for quite a while. But I was born, I was born and raised right here my grandmother is the one that taught me to hunt and fish at a young age. So I've been around guns my entire life. My, my dad owns an arsenal. I can tell you right now what would happen if I went to his house and told him I was taking his guns. <laughs> there'd, be, there'd be about six people carrying me the following week. But, uh, so I'm a very big fan of the Second Amendment. Something I would like to expand on that I didn't hear it touched on here that I would like to push for if given the opportunity to be your next sheriff. If any of you are following constitutional carry across the U.S., it's now been passed in 25 states, I believe, and I feel that if you're a law-abiding citizen, you should have the right to carry your firearm however you choose without the, law, without the government interfering in that. Um, I know that I've read on that, and I like that stance because if North Carolina, everybody knows, is an open carry state. You can carry your gun anywhere as long as it's not posted. Well, if I'm someone there to do harm and I don't have my weapon with me, we're probably going to be fighting over yours. So if I, if I get the best of you and I take your weapon, then I'm going to have a weapon right there because it's an open carry. Um, on the flip side of that, if uh, you've got a weapon, it's open carry, and I've got one as well, guess who my first target's going to be if I don't want to go up against opposition? 
the one that's carrying the firearm. So I think if you're a law-abiding citizen in the state of North Carolina, you should be able to carry that firearm however you choose. And I would love to get the folks behind me so that we can hopefully get some legislation passed to where we can turn North Carolina into a constitutional carry state. Thank you. Mr. Cook. No, you're going to start the next question. I started the last one. What? I started the last one. You start, oh, that's right, you did. All right, I'm sorry. I'm glad you're paying attention. The question to you, Mr. Browning, and the other four remaining would be, would the Macon County Sheriff's Office, under your leadership, cooperate with federal and state agencies for violations other than drug violations? Um, yes, yeah, we cooperate with the federal and state on anything that we can work with. Uh, one particular thing would be uh, such as like an ice detainer, things like that. Um, if you get an illegal immigrant that comes through as an arrest and you get a hit on, on them through the system through ICE, then yes, we'd contact ICE and um, see if they're, they're willing to want us to put a hold on so they can come pick them up. Um, but yeah, working with the outside agencies, yeah, I absolutely would have to. Uh, with the resources that we have up here, which we all know is, is quite small for a small town, then you get into a situation, there's a lot of times you're going to have to call on SBI, and sometimes if it's uh, within the jurisdiction, you're going to have to get with the FBI and work with them also. But if we don't cooperate with each other across the board, then you're really going to get nowhere, you know. You have to have cooperation in order to be an effective leader. And uh, you can't do everything on your own. You, know, you have to rely and work with other people, outside agencies, um, and just locally. I mean, you got to work with your fire, or police departments, your highway patrol, and all your outside agencies. But absolutely, I would be uh, very open and I'm looking forward to working with them on certain cases. Thank you. Absolutely, I agree with Chris. We have to work with all agencies, both federal and state. Um, I'm going to touch back on the, T the TFOs. We do have one currently here in this in this room with the FBI and one with Homeland Security. I see in the back, but no, we don't have one from the DEA folks. We don't. Homeland Security is Homeland Security. DEA is drugs, drugs. So we have we have to work with the the uh, DEA. We have to. And uh, the TFO for Western North Carolina is actually back in the hallway, and I've spoke to him uh, in depth about that, and he's willing to facilitate and help us. Uh, it's just extending that olive branch and do and doing that. <coughs> The beauty, the beauty about working investigations all those years and, and who he's mentioned in the hallway there working with him with, with drug cases and having the experience working juvenile cases, uh, even, even a couple murders a few years ago. I've had the opportunity to work with Homeland Security. I've had the opportunity to work with the FBI, the SBI, and for those several drug cases, the DEA. And uh, we, can't, we can't stress it enough that not only drugs, but other cases, child, child cases, the uh, Homeland Security come in, zip your computer, you can have things back reasonably, reasonably quick. Uh, when you pull resources together like that and you're utilizing these state and these federal agencies, you're taking a lot of burden off of your local county taxpaying dollar. Um, that's money, money that we're not having to ask and raise a tax or ask for more money in a budget. You know, you pull these resources, we, we, offer, we offer the same services across the board. We, we team up with, say, the Franklin Police Department, the Highlands Police Department, uh, other local jurisdictions and other counties, but it is paramount that we continue to work with the TFOs and expand upon those TFOs and, again, team with the D Drug Enforcement Administration in the very, very near future. You know, like they've touched on, we're, being from a small agency here in Western North Carolina, we are oftentimes limited on the resources we have. So having access to these state and federal agencies, federal agencies and a lot of the equipment, the tools, the manpower that they're able to provide us is something that we've got to have. And we rely on those services on a regular basis. You know, we currently actually provide an office space for our local SBI agent. 
We work with our federal state partners on a regular basis in investigations, whether that be SBI, whether that be Homeland Security, whether that be FBI, um, whether that be U.S. Marshals. U.S. Marshals come in here and work with us on a regular basis. So we have a great working partnership with several of our federal agencies. And I feel like the reason that we use Homeland so much is because they're so versatile. They're able to work with us in many different capacities. They're not geared towards one specific area. Um, I like to say they, they, they can do it all, but uh, we have a great working relationship with our federal partners, and I look to improve upon that. Thank you. Mr. Cook. Well, having been the only candidate up here that's actually been assigned as a task force officer with the DEA, I know the benefit of working with them for other uh, anything beyond the drugs. Because my cases have touched on the Joint Terrorism Task Force cases. I've had the FBI with me. I've had the Homeland Security people with me when I was doing food stamp fraud. Um, but we also have to cooperate with all these other agencies because we're all part of the same team. And if we can't cooperate with everybody, then, then the team starts falling apart. Not everybody has all the all the um, the tools that we need to get a case done, particularly when it comes to child porn, the um, the internet, the, uh, internet uh, crimes against children uh, people, they have to have different kinds of um, assets than, than, say, the drug guys do. And if we don't cooperate with everybody, we can't utilize those assets. Now, the other thing that, that being a TFO brings to the table, and, and I was, like I said, I was a TFO. When, we knocked, when my unit down in Florida knocked off uh, Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega. Our unit, as a, had, I was, I had nothing to do with the case, but our unit did it. And so, what we were able to do is, when they seized all of his money, part of that seizure came to our unit, to our department. We we were able to share uh, our share of it was a million dollars. So, as a TFO, whenever somebody sees money within that unit, everybody shares it, and that's the advantage of being part of that that kind of a team. But we have to cooperate with everybody. Because we have, everybody brings something different to the table. The FBI has, everybody, believe it or not, none of these people have the same database. The DEA database is different than the FBI's. So we have to be able to utilize all these different organizations to be able to, to do our investigations and make sure they're thorough and complete. Thank you. Mr. Browning. He's already answered. Throw it back up here. Back up. With you. Yes, sir. This gets more confusing. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of it. You go ahead. Oh. Yeah. Speak. No, I've already answered it. I need a question. I need a question. It's time, it's question. time for the new one. Yes. Right. I'm waiting on you. <laughs> oh, you weren't. The question is, if elected sheriff, what is your specific plan to tackle the growing drug epidemic that's plaguing Macon County? Folks, I spoke about that earlier, uh, a multi-agency narcotics unit. Um, <laughs> I see you shaking. A multi-agency narcotics unit, and uh, that unit, like I, like I said, was comprised of agencies in Western North Carolina, uh, and it, re it yielded great results. It did. Uh, um, Operation Spider Web, Spider Web, Christmas Crackdown, uh, that's the two that I can remember off the top of my head. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. I've, I've already touched on that, folks. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Looking, looking back over the years, I know, I know with uh, one we mentioned in the hallway, working Operation Nacho Cheese, working Operation Thunderstruck, and uh, many, many more. The last one, Jawbreaker. You know, again, we've got to continue to uh, hit it head on. We've got to partner with the, the agencies we mentioned. But at the same time, <coughs> there's people that need help that's right here in the, in the county that are addicts that ask for help. And, uh, and I find that I find that the mental health and the substance abuse programs obviously have been cut and cut and cut across the state. And uh, we have expanded upon many programs within the detention facility and out in the community. And if it saves one life, I'm all for it. Uh, we've got to continue to educate the public on drug abuse. We've got to reach the kids at a young age and teach the kids about drug abuse. And I look at doing that through youth programs. You know, so again, fighting it on the front side, there's a back side to it too, guys. And that's about getting in, getting your hands dirty, finding these individuals help no matter what it takes. And uh, I've been blessed. We've, we've, we started a jail, another jail ministry program. We've handed out between 75 and 100 Bibles. 
We play music. Uh, we talk about problems, the triggers that affect them. So there's there's two. It's a two prong approach. We've already discussed one. Second is helping the ones that request assistance. Guys, I'm going to touch on this briefly. The Manu unit was brought up. I worked back during that era, and I can tell you that the reason that unit was disbanded is because a lot of the work wasn't being done in Macon County. We broke away from that program. We currently have what I call a task force right here in Macon County where we've combined with Franklin PD. I know we've also reached out or looking to reach out to hopefully get Highlands PD involved in that, but I am very interested in doing a task force right here in Macon County with our local agencies. I think that would be a win-win for everybody involved. But going back to how we're gonna tackle this problem that we're facing, I think it's a three-prong approach. I think the first prong of that is through education. We have to educate our youth. Um, I did a canine demonstration back about two months ago where I asked a group of 10th graders um, how many in the classroom had seen illegal narcotics in their life. Two-thirds of the classroom raised their hand. Where they see that at home, where they see that in a peer group, or they see that with friends. I don't know. I didn't ask that question. I told them I'd ask them one. So we have to do more on the education side. We have to educate our youth, and we're going to do that through the DARE program. We're revamping the DARE program right now. There's also another program that I'm looking to implementing into the high school age children, and I'm also wanting to put a canine back in the school system to help as a deterrent within the school system. Second is the enforcement side. We have to do more on the enforcement level. Yes, we have one officer right now at the sheriff's office that solely focuses on narcotics, but many of us wear many hats. So we help that one officer out as often as possible. But we do need to expand on our narcotics unit. And that is what I have a plan for now. I'm looking to have five to six officers in that unit once taking office. And that will go from one, like I said, to five or six. So that would increase productivity here in Macon County. Uh, after that, you've got rehabilitation side. We have to rehabilitate those that are wanting to be rehabilitated. And we do that through programs we offer in our jail. Thank you. Bob. I, I spoke on this a lot in my, my proposals on my website. Um, there's a couple things that I'm going to do right off the bat. I'm going to make sure that we have a drug tip hotline. That's going to be a hard line that's going to be assigned to a sergeant's desk. And when that, when that call comes in, that sergeant's going to be responsible for making sure he logs in the complaint and then gets it to the detective and the investigation is done. They'll have to be answering to the supervisors as to what the progress of that investigation is. Without, without answering the, the complaints, eventually what happens is the thing just the whole drug thing gets out of control. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start working with our federal partners. I'm going to work with our federal partners such as the DEA and the FBI, but also I'm going to work with the AUSAs, the, the, the uh, U.S. attorneys in Asheville. If we're not getting the cases, the, the kind of sentences and the kind of uh, prosecutions that we need here in Macon County, I will go pros I will go with the prosecutors in, in Asheville, the U.S. attorneys, and I will see about getting them to t pick up these cases. Frequently, when the U.S. attorneys pick up something, it's a lot more time because they have a certain uh, specific schedule they have to go by. Um, the, the other thing is I'm also the only one up here that's actually dismantled a number of drug organizations. And I start from the bottom, and I go all the way to the top. And I'm the only one that's been able to do that over a period of time. I've done it over 14 years of doing this. So I've had a lot of experience in that. So I recognize the, uh, the, the signs. I recognize... Um, the, the patterns and the methods of these, and I don't matter if it's in the mountains or if it's, it's in the flatlands of Florida, the, the patterns and, and the methods are pretty much all the same. The last thing is, is like the, they've been saying, is rehab. That's a big problem. That's a big problem. If we don't do rehab, then we're going to have more more people just keep coming back and back and back and forth. I do not believe in the revolving door method. <clears throat> I proposed a, a medical treatment program that once they get into jail, we start treating it as a medical uh, as a medical issue as opposed to a criminal issue. And without that, we've been we've, the studies show that a repeat offender when he gets out of jail after going cold turkey, he'll have a 40% chance more chance of uh, relapsing and overdosing, and a 17 less chance of being uh, reoffended. Thank you. Chris, grab your mic. Make can't hear you in the back. Okay, yeah, we've already uh, spoke quite a bit about this, but there is one thing I would like to add that I have been talking about lately is a highway interdiction team. When you look at Macon County, look at 441 South here coming north out of Georgia, that is one of our main thoroughfares that drugs is coming out of Athens and Atlanta 
We also have quite a bit of heroin and, and other drugs coming from Asheville now. But we need a team that is actually out here dedicated to working the roads. And I'm not going to say that they're going to be working road every day, but we need to have at least a five-man team that is trained specifically in highway interdiction and also incorporate canines into this unit so that we can actually get out here and work these roads because I know for a fact you get a lot of tips about who's bringing it in, what they're driving, who it is, uh, standard times that they're bringing it into the, the different uh, locations. But it's not just coming into Macon County. It's coming right through us, and there's a lot of it that, that does get dropped here, but there's a lot that goes on to these other counties, that, but it's coming through us. So why are we not out here working the highways? And, if we, and you know, you get a good bus, here and there you're making progress because it never even gets to the drug dealer. You can stop them before they get there. We have to start working all sides as, as these gentlemen have talked about. Uh, I have spent time with the director at No Wrong Door. One of the big issues going on right now is the addiction and the Narcan use. Um, they're noticing a lot of problems with people that are getting Narcan multiple times, you know, from week to week. They're, mental pro they're having mental issues and it's not proven, but they believe it's because of this. It's a pattern that they're seeing. So yes, we have to definitely start working and doing everything we possibly can. As the sheriff, which would be my, mainly as you get an arrest, the addicts come through the jail system is how you'd be with the addicts with the different outside agencies. And each person that asks for help deserves help. Thank you. Slot the lock down the ramp. What do you need to do? He can keep it up. Yeah, I'll speak up. Sorry. Check this out. Hold on. Question, question to you is there is a lot of interest in drug enforcement, but how do you balance the desire to aggressively enforce drug laws and with all of the limit with all of the limitation from the courts which are outside of the control of law enforcement? Sounds like a court system question. Uh, it's tough. No, no, no. It's it, it's fine. You know, one one we're going to get out and we're going to do our job. And we're going to do our job to the best of our abilities. You know, uh, we we're going to focus on doing what's best for the community. And we're going to, as we've all stated time and time again tonight, we're going to fight the drug problem. You know, uh, once they're arrested, you know, bond bond is not something that is used for punishment. And uh, the judge issues, magistrate issues a, a, a initial, at the initial appearance, gives them a secured bond, unsecured bond, whatever it may be. And uh, it's up to them to provide that they're going to show up in court. Uh, there's nothing that we can do about that. So, you know, as we arrest these individuals, we're going to follow their cases through. We're going to either convict them or... We're going to take them to trial, and they fight. They prove their innocence, whatever it may be. But you know, that's something that we're going to work hand in hand with daily with the court system and go through the process. Uh, unfortunately, the courts are backed up. We've seen the whole situation with COVID over the last uh, last couple of years. When uh, when COVID hit, when courts down one month, it's knocked you off about three months. So again, we're going to work hand in hand with the court system, and uh, we're going to see that the cases get handled. Let me repeat that question. <coughs> Although drug enforcement seems to be the main topic on most voters' minds, there is much more to commanding the sheriff's office. What expen no, no, what experience? No, no, no. no, no. Oh, you just sorry, sorry, flipped it too soon. There's basically it's about the same. Drugs. There is a lot of interest in drug enforcement. How do you balance the desire to aggressively enforce drug laws? with all of the limitation from the courts, which are outside the control of law enforcement. Well, I'm gonna answer that question just a little bit different. I agree with Derek, with everything that he said, um, but I wanna to touch a little bit on the narcotic side of this. You know, case law dictates how we do business. It tells us what we can and what we can't do, and we've experienced this over the years, and, it, and we're constantly having case law handed down that changes how we do business. We had search incident to arrest taken away from us back in the early 2000s. So therefore, we could no longer search based on the fact that it was an arrest. A couple years ago, something else that got handed down the pike to us that affected us tremendously on the drug side was the scope of the stop. They come down with this, you've got to stick to the scope of the stop, meaning that if I stop you for speeding, 
I got to stick to the scope of that stop. I can't deviate from that without being able to articulate um, that the reason that I uh, went from a speeding stop to a drug stop. I've got to be able to articulate that in a court of law. And with the young officers that we have today, being the captain over patrol, the majority of my officers have five years experience or less. So that's very hard to do. So what we've done to combat that is try to put canines out on the stops with those officers to conduct what we call a free air sniff around those vehicles to give us the PC in order to get into those vehicles to search those vehicles. And with that being done, our deployments in our canine program have skyrocketed. Our canine uh, program alone had over 600 deployments last year um, in working with our patrol guys as well as our NARC guys and our detectives. Mr. Cook. Well, as I understand the question, is how do we interface what we do with the courts and what they're, what they're doing? So how we do that is to keep up on what the courts are doing. If we don't know what, what the new decisions are, our, our detectives or our officers are not going to are going to make mistakes. And it's going to be honest mistakes, but it's going to be a mistake because they didn't know what changed. One of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to institute legal bulletins as, as court decisions are made that we need to know. I'm going to institute legal bulletins that, that our, so our detectives and our officers will know every time the new one comes out what that, what that legal bulletin is and what, what, how it applies to them, how they're going to do their job. Um, much like he's talking about, I had a case where I was searching for a, I had a box, I sold some heroin, or a box of heroin right off of a guy, and we went to stop his car, and we, we on, when we searched his car, searched incident to arrest, which we all know was legal, that particular day the Supreme Court struck down search incident to arrest. I did not know that, nobody knew that, except for the lawyer that was took it to. And so you have to be up to date on all the most recent changes, and that's how I'm going to make sure that we interface with whatever the courts decide. We can't just go out there blindly and not keep up on that information. That's why training is so important. We get training in the academy, and we go through a lot of legal training. That's a whole week block, I believe, isn't it? Legal training? What's that? In, in the academy, legal update. Legal update. Law, law, criminal law. Anyway, I think it's about a whole week training in the, in the academy. But we typically only get a little bit every year when we, when we get to in-service training. So I want to make sure that we know throughout the year when, when changes are made. And so that our deputies and our, and our uh, traffic officers all know when something has changed. Thank you. Well, I'll say the number one problem is I've thought about this uh, throughout this campaign is working at the judicial system. The number one problem is where your judges are hamstrung being able to hand down the sentence that a lot of times someone will deserve off of many different crimes. But obviously, trailers is the number one. But it's, there's no prison space, you know. It's the same thing with a hospital. What are you going to do when you got a bunch of people but there's nowhere to put them? They, that, that's how come they end up a lot of them walking free or getting very little out of it. So that all falls back on your North Carolina legislature and the governor. That's where we need to start working right there. It's working them and pushing them to do more to help so that the judges and the district attorney can better do their job and not be hamstrung to only being able to do this and that. You have to reduce, you know, you take somebody with felony drug charges and then they get reduced down to misdemeanors. I mean, that's, that's really uncalled for. But as far as the sheriff is concerned and working this, the way I see it is the sheriff, he's law enforcement. So if you go arrest somebody, they turn them loose to turn around and get back on, do the best you can to get the evidence you need to arrest them again, just stay on it. The job of the sheriff is to arrest. Get them into the court. You need nothing we can do past that point. We can work with the district attorney the best we can and get the best relationship working with them that we can, you know, to, to better things, especially on our high profile cases. You know, when you got somebody that's been caught for a large amount of drugs or whatever, then you want to have that working relationship to where we can work to not have those charges reduced and pushed out of court. So we've got to work all together. But it's, um, it, it just falls down to the sheriff doing his job and working the best you can and doing what you can with the judicial system because we have no authority over that. So that's where I stand. We'll just keep arresting them and doing our job. Thank you. 
this is a hot topic, drugs. <laughs> I mean, it seems like we're back at it. <clears throat> and this, I think this question needs to, to go more so to the clerk of court candidates and not us law enforcement. But with that being said, I agree with what Derek said, and I want to touch on a couple of things. Search incident arrest is not gone. It's not completely gone. It's immediate area. So if I arrest Hazel Norris in her car, I could search her immediate area where she's sitting. And uh, I also want to touch on the, the man U unit, the multi-agency narcotics unit. It didn't disband folks because they weren't doing nothing to make the county. I know this 100% because I was affiliated with that organization. It disbanded because the sheriff, the, the prior sheriff in, in Cherokee, Counter, Cherokee County, Bump Lovin, I can't think of his real name, everybody knows him as Bumper, Bumper Lovin, he wanted to take control of that unit Keith. and, <coughs> Keith Lovin, thanks. He wanted to take control of that unit and, and, uh, manage the money so uh, so there you go and I also think that the drug issues that we're dealing dealing with needs to be a two-prong approach when X amount of officers to deal with local issues that that arise and then we need X amount of officers to deal with where these drugs are coming from they're coming from somewhere uh, the, our borders are wide open uh, they're bringing it in here in truckloads so Thank you. Here we go again. New question. Mm -hmm. New question. <laughs> new yeah, question. new question. Almost the same. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Although drug enforcement seems to be the main topic on most voters' minds, there is much more to commanding the sheriff's office. What experience do you have at the minimum of a supervisory level for divisions such as patrol, investigations, detention, or civil process courthouse security, and have you ever prepared a budget for any of these divisions? Okay. With that being said, I told you earlier, I've worked with every unit within the sheriff's office. We're a small agency. Many of us wear many hats, so that requires a lot of cooperation amongst the units. So I've had the luxury to work with every unit within the agency over the past 22 years of my career. As I told you, I've worked my way up through the ranks over the year, currently serving as your captain over patrol. Um, been in my current position, I started out as a patrol officer. I worked up to a corporal, to a sergeant, to a first sergeant, and now a captain. I also spent two years in narcotic investigations where I did specialize in criminal interdiction. My canine guys, all my canine guys that I currently supervise have all went through interdiction courses somewhere in, in the state or a neighboring state. So they have that training now. They utilize that training now, but there's more that we have to do. And, I, and you know, going back, I actually talked about have we written anything for the budget. This upcoming budget, I submitted something new that we're trying to implement right here in Macon County, and that's an LPR system. That's a license plate recognition system to help in this war on drugs, to help further our um, investigations, whether that be narcotic investigations or property crimes or what have you. We're going to use that LPR system to benefit our small agency being that extra set of eyes out there on the road for us to give us the ability to put tag numbers into this machine and it'll notify us when certain vehicles go by. So it's going to be a great asset here in North Carolina or in Western North Carolina right here in Macon County. As far as budgets, you know, I have managed budgets probably for the last decade for the Sheriff's Office. You know, the budgets I manage, they're not huge, but I do manage them. Just like the Bible says, if I can trust you with a little, I can trust you with a lot. But I have over a decade now of managing budgets within the Sheriff's Office. Thank you. Well, I'm a little bit of a disadvantage. My unit, or the department that I work for, we had 1,700 officers, and we have a much different promotion system than than, uh, than we do here in Macon County. So therefore, I, I didn't serve as a supervisor in these in, as a uh, over any of the units. However, I was a Navy chief. I was a supervisor for many many years in the military, and it doesn't matter if you're a supervisor in the military or a supervisor in the police department. Managing people is a basic skill that, that we learn, and so I don't have to manage people because I've done it for many many years. Now, also in the narcotics unit. 
every time I had a case that was uh, like a particular wiretap case, I was the lead agent. I was the lead detective on it. So I managed that particular uh, uh, case from the very beginning to the very end. And that meant I had to manage when people had to go out to do surveillance. I had to manage when, when we had to do search warrants. I had to manage when we had to do arrests. I had to make sure that all that was done as a supervisor of that particular organ of that particular operation, and so I was. I've had lots of experience in that. Now, um, budgets. Like I said before, I've, I've managed a budget. wasn't in the police department. In my homeowner association for probably better than ten years. I managed a budget of probably twenty-one thousand dollars. Now that's not much. I know that. But what I do know is that I didn't spend twenty-two thousand dollars. I didn't spend money I didn't have. I didn't go after more money because I spent all the money on, on frivolous things. So what I did is I made sure I managed our money properly, and that's what I'll do. I have a copy of the budget for Macon County Sheriff's Office for, for, from the last year, and so I've gone over what that budget is. I know that they have a $280,000 budget request at that time for uh, overtime. I will look at my line items like that as your sheriff, and I will make sure that we're spending your money the right way for the right things, so that I don't have to go back to the county commissioners and try and get more. Thank you. Yeah, once again, I touched on this earlier. Uh, I'm the one I don't have 40 years of experience working under the sheriff in, in Macon County. But in supervisory positions, I've done that ever since I was 20 years old. When I was in the military, I was tapped to be the youngest trainer or uh, satellite commanders that was ever uh, picked. I was picked by my squadron commander to do this and take on the job, so that's that was my first supervisory position. I was put in charge of, of all the training for satellite commanders specifically. And I trained all the way from lieutenant colonels all the way down to sergeants. And it was a, quite a unique experience when you're 20 years old and you're given control over a lieutenant, lieutenant colonel or a major whenever they outrank you, but in a training situation under space command rules, I was the boss. I told them what they had to do in the training situation. So it was a lot to take on at 20 years old. It was a great experience because you get thrown to the fire, you know. You, you learn quick in how to how to uh, supervise and keep up with uh, all the different things that's going on that you have to make sure it's getting done because these, these men and women have to be trained. They had to go through a whole certification process before we could turn them loose to do their job. And whenever your job is to protect uh, men and women's life out in the field, that's what we did every day working with classified material. We worked with satellites, so we was working with uh, all across the Middle East and everything else. But supervising budgets in private business, I have managed a multi-million multi dollar budget for years. And that's much different because, once again, I'm working with my money, and in that situation, uh, I'm taking my dollar and stretching it as far as I can in order to try to turn a profit. Now, if I take that and reverse it and go in with the sheriff and take that dollar and stretch it as far as I can to save money within the budget of the sheriff's office, that's what I intend to do. Folks, the majority of your crime here in Macon County, your property crime, your domestic violence, your assault, your violent assaults, all that revolve around drugs. They do. And people's asked me since I've started this journey and this campaign, um, what experience do you have in those areas? Day one, your experience. Because like Clay said, we're a small agency. So you learn you learn quick. You learn property crimes. You learn assaults. You, I mean, you learn how to investigate those things on scene. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a given from a small department. And budget, I have no clue about a budget. No idea. But with that being said, I have spoke to Sheriff Holland. He had no clue what a budget was when he started. No idea. And he has agreed to facilitate those, the budget if elected. Um, I also have a great relationship with the county manager. Uh, he was in her wedding, as a matter of fact, Derek, Derek Rowland. So it's it, it's it all it's who you surround yourself with, you, you know, like-minded people. Um, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? Budget. Sheriff's office and the sheriff himself obviously 
has to worry about and be concerned with other things other than drugs and personnel, et cetera. And one of those is budget, and that's being a good steward of your taxpaying dollar. And over the last three and a half years, I got thrown to the wolves, as I stated earlier, when I took over to the detention center, the first thing I had to do was, is oversee a budget, a budget of about $3 million. During that time, we were going through different contracts, and when I say thrown to the wolves, I walked in, and there were several contracts that were expired, nearing to expire. We had a uh, food company that walked out on us. So immediately I had to step in, renegotiate contracts for the phone company, the uh, Kimball's commissary company, the food service for, for the inmate, uh, many other different things. I've got 20 something line items, up $3 million in a budget that I have to, I have to work each and every year. Uh, of those certain line items, you may have contracted services that has seven or eight line items within a line item. So when I tell you that I'm budget minded, and I think about where that dollar is going to be spent. I think about you before I go and ask for that money because do we need it or do we not need it? Is it something that's going to, that, that can, can wait? Can we look for it through a grant? Can we uh, get it through LESS? I oversee the Law Enforcement Support Services uh, program where we get free federal excess property from the federal government for no uh, cost to you, the county taxpayer. So to say I've worked a budget, I've worked a budget, I've worked it regularly, I've done so the last three years. I've found ways to, to uh, spend money with money existing without asking for more. I don't recklessly spend. We have top of the line programs within our facility and I'm gonna do the best of my abilities if elected the sheriff will be the same way. Uh, talking with seven, eight, nine million dollars, whatever the budget is at this current time. So do I have budget experience? Absolutely I do, as well as policy and uh, procedure writing. I just revamped the whole 75 policies in the detention center back in 2019. You started this. I started it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you, Bob Cook, get I'll the, take the next one. Okay, you get it. Oh, you're going to like this one. How do you plan to recruit and retain deputies and detention officers? Well, one of the things I did in the Navy, I did 12 years in Navy recruiting. I realized it's a little different, but the problem is, is what you have to do is you have to actually go to the colleges to recruit. Now, I know what they do now, but I spent two and a half years working at the making or the South Community College Public Safety Training Center, and for that two and a half years, I rarely ever saw Macon County come out. So one of the things that I want to do is make sure that we actually recruit very heavily out of that particular police <coughs> academy. I will also go to the other academies in our tri-state area to try and recruit. And I will, uh, there's several different uh, things that I want to harp on, and, and one of them is, is I want to recruit a, a Hispanic liaison officer. So I want to make sure I, re I recruit a Spanish speaker if possible. Um, but I want to make sure that we are, are hit these colleges. Now they have uh, um, the uh, job fairs. I want to make sure we continue to do that. And I want to make sure this, that we get our information out. We can advertise in, in uh, law enforcement periodicals. Um, but right here, the majority of it's going to have to be from our own area. So we're going to have to recruit heavily out of Southwestern Community College, WNC, and try and give them, and give them uh, the benefit of what we have to offer here in Michigan. Just like you pointed out earlier, we have gotten pay raises that, that makes us pretty competitive with the area. And once we make sure that that, that, that information is out, that makes it a little bit easier to recruit. But we have to get out there and aggressively recruit with the different police academies and the two colleges that we have in our area. Thank you. On recruitment, I'd have to start out and say I do agree with Mr. Cook. Uh, we got to actively recruit out of uh, our BLET courses through Southwestern. Also, we got to actively be recruiting all the time through media, social media, and um, the biggest thing that's going to help with the recruitment is going back to morale, that it's mostly leadership. Pay is always important, but I have talked to officers and others that will tell you that the most important thing to them is who they work for, the environment within they have to work. So if you create an environment that you have the officers within the department saying good things and they're saying good things for the buddies that work somewhere else, you're going to start drawing people to come over to want to work for you because it's an environment they want to work in. That's the most important thing you're going to get from any, anybody. you got to work anywhere. You want to be in a good environment. You want to uh, have the top leadership where you know they have your back and that's going to be the most important thing it'll take a few months for people to start seeing that within out in the law enforcement community 
And also, like I said, you know, we got to work the colleges and actively recruit as they're graduating out of BLET and, and see if we can recruit those guys to come in and work for us. Thank you. I agree with Chris. We need to reach out to, to uh, community colleges and universities for Murphy DiManio. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that sign. And there's one in Murphy. It says Murphy DiManio. It's the longest state. But for Murphy DiManio, uh, flyers, social media, email. Um, also, in, incentive pay for officers, officers that are officers in other other uh, agencies that's are, that already has you know the the training, the cert certifications. Um, uh, that's that's a great way, and I, I agree with Chris. Morale morale's down here, but it's down everywhere because of all this defund the police and this Black Lives Matter. We're people too, folks. Well, our feelings get hurt too, and that's that's the reason I think our, our morale is down. And we got to change that. Great work environment. Um, yeah, great work environment. We, we've got to we've got to boost our morale. Absolutely. supports the blue. Thank you, Jimmy. Being a, being in a management and supervising position for at least twelve out of seventeen years that I've been with the sheriff's office, leaders got to lead from the front. Uh, there's a major difference between a manager and a leader. Management's more concerned about numbers and day-to-day -day operations. A leader, a leader envisions the future. And it's got it's got to be led by the right individual. Uh, you know, as they've already stated, you know, morale morale is down. We see we see constantly. Doesn't matter if it like say Black Lives Matter, the KKK, whoever it is. You know. There's, there's bad apples in, in every flock. But the, fa the fact of the matter is is we've got to continue to support our people. We've got to continue to show them that we care. Incentive pays. One of the first things that I want to look into is incentive pay. If you go back and you, you get your two-year degree, you get your four-year degree, I want to see people be rewarded for what they've done. You go and you get extra certifications, finish the criminal investigation certificate program, maybe a one percent. But you know, put put back, put back, and put into the officers that have put in the time and dedicated their time and their energy to better themselves. Education's not about that piece of paper. You know, it's about bettering yourself, better equipping yourself to go out and educate and deal with the public. You know. We've got a great group of officers. Stand by them daily. You know, we can't thank them enough. But uh, morale, we've got to get morale back, and uh, and I believe that's one of the first steps. Guys, I'm not going to reiterate what was just said, but all these guys are right. You know, we've got to when it comes to recruitment and retention. We have job fairs that are hosted here in this area. We have members of our own agencies that goes out and takes part in those job fairs. We've got one of our in-house training coordinators that is one of the primary instructors or one of the head instructors out at SEC. He's out there on a regular basis trying to recruit people out of that BLET course. Um, the problem is this ain't a Macon County problem. This is a national problem. And I appreciate you saying what you did because I remember just a few years ago when we had two BLM rallies right here in Macon County. It was demoralizing to our officers. But not long after that, I seen our community step up and we had a Blue Lives Rally Matter. And that meant more to our officers than anything. And I can honestly say no matter where I go, Macon County stands behind their law enforcement. We had another officer that went to another big agency across the country and uh, one of the comments that was made, you know, you've got a coffee shop up here on Main Street. What would happen if somebody jumped on you in that coffee shop? Well, I can tell you, everybody else in that coffee shop is going to jump in the fence of that officer. <laughs> he said, not where we're from. He said, everybody's going to jump on that officer. So that's the kind of stuff that you see across the country and it's really put a bad impression and a bad outlook on law enforcement and it's hard to re get young people today interested in the law enforcement because of this national stigma that has been put on law enforcement. So that's something that we have to work hard to change here at a local level. And if given that opportunity, that's exactly what we want to try and, and accomplish. Thank you. Mr. Browning, you get to start this one. Will you support staff in furthering their education? And if so, how will you do it? Well, absolutely. Uh, education and training is always important. You've got to continue to 
further your education and training within the department. I would back anyone that chooses on their own that wants to go and further their education as far as college, if they want to go get their associates in criminal justice or, or go on and get their four year, get their bachelor's degree. Obviously, I'm going to support that, and I agree with what uh, some of the guys was talking about the incentive pay. If they're willing to take their own time and do that, then the sheriff's office and the make and make county should be incentivizing them and giving them the extra pay and uh, maybe comp time, whatever you can come up with to incentivize those guys and women to go out and further and further their education because that does nothing but help your department. If they can get the education, hey, I'm all for that. Training within the department is going to training classes. That's important also uh, to further their, their training within their, their specialized job, whether it's road investigations or whatever they're doing. <coughs> training is important so that you do keep up with the change in laws or just tactics and better ways of doing things. You, you, you're going to learn every time you go out to uh, train. Uh, I was talking about the highway interdiction earlier. That's something I talked about. I'd love to get those guys. Once you get formed, put together, and uh, funded, and uh, and send them somewhere that they work a whole lot of highway interdiction to like a larger department where they're working major roads, and let them work with them for you know a couple of weeks. Look at the valuable time that that's going to cut down on our our learning curve. And they can get out there and see real world and work with another department, another sheriff that you could work with. But you have training, completely uh, agree and on board with the further training in all situations. Very good. I think this uh, ties back into what Derek and I both uh, focused on there as a center pay. Absolutely. Further your, further your education, further your career. Um, things are changing, laws are changing. The criminals are changing. They're getting smarter. We need training to to get one step ahead, and it's, it always seems that we're one step behind. So yes, absolutely, we need uh, incentives for off for officers and employees to to further their education. It'll be it'll be uh, great for the department. Great for the community. Absolutely. <clears throat> As an individual that graduated Franklin High School in the year 2000 and initially went to college, went to college on a track scholarship, uh, decided to come home and be the police. So I decided to do things the backwards way. I went, ended up going back after my child was born. Uh, before she was one full year of age, I finished my Associate of Arts degree in 2008. While she was still small, I was working a full-time and a part-time job at Southwest Community College as the uh, in-service training coordinator in a part-time capacity. I finished my, my four-year degree. I know what it takes to go that extra mile. I want to see officers invest that time and energy and I want to see them be rewarded for doing that. Again, I stated a while ago, you know, what better way? You've got to be willing to educate yourself before you can be willing to educate others. And, uh, you know, education's key here. Experience comes a long way. So, Again, invest in your officers, pay them back. I know used two years ago, the county refunded so much of tuition, but uh, you never can go wrong in, in uh, education. Like I said earlier, chiefs of police must have at least four year degree before you can be hired in. A lot of agencies to be able to promote through the system, you've got to have a two year or four year degree. You know, I don't see that anytime soon here in Macon County as to for the sheriff's office because you've got to think about again in uh, in the budget and asking for more money for salaries and etc but uh, i do believe in paying and and showing appreciation for those officers that go on and further further their learning after you would make a question you want a new question sure give me a new one oh, i'll throw this one at you okay <laughs> i'm not up though but no, you i know you're not i'm gonna wait for you to finish but you're gonna get a good one yes yeah. his question yeah, still, still, still his question weren't you listening <laughs> all right i'm just keeping will, with the toes will, will you support in furthering their education and if so how will you do it Guys, we got a current administration that supports each one of us furthering our education wholeheartedly. Um, if you look at my resume, my resume was built after I joined the Macon County Sheriff's Office. So we encourage education, we encourage, and we allow anybody and everybody that signs up for a class. I can't remember or think of a time 
unless it's during COVID when we're short staffed that people's been turned down wanting to further their education. Now it's like with every job, not everybody's passionate enough, they want to further their education. They're comfortable in the position they're currently at. They don't have any intentions of going further, but those that are in it for the right reasons, that want to further themselves, they want to further their agency, they want to further their county, their communities, they have that opportunity now and I want to continue that. Um, as far as incentivizing education, I'm not opposed to that. That's definitely something that I will look towards in the future, but we do encourage people educating themselves as often as they choose. As long as we have the availability, we have the resources to cover shifts for them when they're taken off. But our current administration um, definitely pushes education and I will continue. <coughs> One of the things that every, like everybody's talking about is incentive pay. That's great. That will help us uh, recruit the, the right number of people that, that we need in these specific areas. For example, a, a Spanish speaking or a foreign language speaking. We can offer incentives for that. But as far as education goes, what we really need to do is make sure that our deputies get the training they want. What I envision doing is on a yearly evaluation, asking each deputy when they get evaluated, having your supervisors ask these deputies, what are your goals for the next year? What is it you want to do the next year? What kind of training do you want? And so when they tell us what kind of training it is, then I'll work with Southwestern Community College and the local tri-county areas to get their academies to see if we can't bring in this training. I worked in, the, when I worked at the Southwestern Community College, I worked with them to bring in training from outside. I worked with the Haida coordinator out of Atlanta, but we were bringing in training, all kinds of training, very good training that we could utilize for our, for our department, and it was free didn't cost us anything. And the other thing is, if it does cost something, I want to, I want to find a place in our budget, maybe in our overtime budget, reduce that some, and use that money for training. If we have to bring in somebody that we have to pay to come, maybe we can split it with Southwestern Community College. There was lots of opportunities to do that uh, and, and, and split the money with Southwestern Community College in order to bring in the training that our deputies want. And, and it's, it's surprising how many deputies want the same kind of training, whether it's uh, investigations or it's interviewing that's a big one that a lot of people want we need to bring in these classes active shooter training we need to bring that in so that our that our SROs so they know and we need to make sure that they all get the training that they want and I will make sure as a sheriff that I will bring in the training that we need to make our department a very proactive agency and that we have we are ahead of the trends and that we know what's coming down the road and that we're trained up for it. The de escalation training is another one that I've talked about for a, a number of proposals and we have a, a place in this state that we can take and send our officers to for de escalation training and that will minimize our opportunities for, for uses of force. Thank you. You ready for this? I guess. I don't know. <laughs> All right, here we go. What is the highest level of education that you have obtained, and how many hours of law enforcement training and education would you estimate that you have received in the past 10 years? Well, I graduated. I hated school. Gosh, I hated high school over here. I did. I quit. I went to military school, and I graduated in 1994 from military school in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. A lot of people don't know that. Um, and then in 98, uh, I went to Southwestern Community College and got BLET. Um, that's the reason people go to BLET, because college is expensive. Not everybody can afford a four-year four school. Um, I would say a guesstimation over the past 10 years, 20 years, I've been there almost 23, 800 to 1,000 hours, I have no clue. That's, that's, I'm shooting from the hip, folks. But yeah, 800 to 1,000 hours. Okay. Any degrees with those? No, 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 okay. no. Nope. Just basic law enforcement training. <laughs> we can get, we can get up one more time. <laughs> no. Well, get, well, these I'll guys keep asking me you know, questions. There tonight, these five never got along, and tonight it's just like, hey, oh, we're all. No, busy. listen. Yeah, we all get along. <laughs> we do. Uh, as I stated earlier, uh, graduated high school in 2000. Uh, completed a two-year degree pre-major criminal justice from Southwestern Community College in 2008. 
2012, I completed a Bachelor of Science degree, criminal justice, and uh, BLET, basic law enforcement training, 2004. Uh, completed the uh, criminal investigation certificate program, 2017. That's 500 hours of investigative training alone. I did that from 2015, 2017. So I would say I'm probably pushing a 2000 uh, of non mandated, with mandated and non mandated training, we're probably between uh, 1,500 and 2,000 hours. And that's in the last 10 to 12 years. So um, <laughs> sit down. I think that's it. <laughs> Clay's adding his all up. Look at this. <laughs> you know, I started, I had a family early in life. And uh, I told you earlier about my daughter that's grown that works for the Highland School System now. Her mother left us when she was three years old. Now she's come back into the picture. She's a great person at this point in her life. But she had a lot of growing up to do just like we all did. With that being said, I didn't get to go to college out of high school. Um, I was able to obtain my BLET certification in the spring of 2000. As I said earlier, I started furthering my education once I became a law enforcement officer here in Macon County. When I told you that the, the opportunities are there, it's up to you on whether or not you want to pursue those opportunities. I just figured up, I just acquired my advanced law enforcement certificate here in the last year or so, I applied for it. And I'm sitting on right now about 2,500 hours of law enforcement specialized instruction in various areas. You know, I'm a general instructor for the state of North Carolina to teach law enforcement related topics. Um, I was a CCH instructor. Um, I have specialties in firearms. I taught rapid deployment. I taught taser. Um, I'm also a chemical munitions instructor. So I have furthered my career once I became a law enforcement officer here in Macon County. And that's the kind of opportunity that I want to give for future recruits here in Macon County. If they want to further their education, they should have that opportunity. Those that just want to be here to collect a paycheck and go home at the end of the day, we got room for those too. But the ones that want to further their education, we've got to provide for them. Thank you. Well, in the last 10 or 12 years, really that's not very big picture for me. Um, I've actually gone back a lot farther. I started my education in 1972 with the U.S. Navy. That's where I started during the Vietnam War. And I went to college through that. I got my associate's degree in administration of justice. Part of that is supervision of police personnel. Once I, one, and also I started going to college for business administration because I wasn't sure uh, which path I wanted to take when I retired. So in the business administration, it taught me a lot about handling, handling uh, things like budgets and things like that, your accounting. Um, as far as police uh, hours go, a lot like these guys, I can't remember how many hours I got. I mean, it's been over 20 years, 20 years, and it, that's been even four or five years ago. But in the last five years, I've been to the North Carolina uh, Instructor School. Mr. Jones is one of my instructors. And uh, I, I got my North Carolina certificate to teach out here at the police academy. And while I'm telling you how much, how many, how much I deal with teaching the class, they get to count it as taking the hours. I teach it. All right. I teach the narcotics and contraband. I teach courtroom testimony. I have a lot of experience in courtroom testimony. I teach interviewing interrogations, and I teach a class that I think is very, very important to me, and that's police ethics. And I spent a lot of time on that on that particular class. So I, I teach those four classes and I've taught it a number of times over the last several years. And I'll continue to teach it in the next near future. I have no intentions of not, not continuing that. Thank you. As far as education, I graduated high school back in 93. Um, through the Air Force, they sent me into several college courses, but I never received an official degree through college. Um, Law enforcement, went through BLET, and I had five years worth of experience working. I'm like Mr. Cook, going back 10 years, I'm not going to show very much. Education, I'm going to touch back a little bit on what we were talking about before since I've got time. Education, I think is great. I encourage it all the way. But as far as promotion, or doing great things in life, a certificate doesn't automatically mean that you should be promoted. But it don't mean that you can't do great things in life. Um, as far as promotion within my department, 
college degrees, education would be taken into consideration, obviously. But I always believe in picking the best man or woman for that position. If I got somebody that I feel like is more motivated and and better over here that doesn't have a big degree, and you got this one that does, I'm gonna pick the one that I feel like is gonna do the best job. Um, but like I said, you know, you can't go wrong with training in college, but that doesn't mean everything in life. You can succeed without it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Derek, if elected, will you increase the training budget to allow for extra training beyond the in-service training and be open to implementing and new updated technology and equipment? <laughs> already, already dealing with a lot of technology and equipment that we've seen obviously put into the detention center, being the kiosks and et cetera, and seeing what the uh, training budget is to begin with, and I know uh, Mr. Cook had mentioned earlier, you know, we're blessed here in Macon County to have, I think, 13, 13 uh, instructors within the agency. Uh, 13 instructors, there's several of us that are specialized instructors. I teach firearms, I teach CPR, I teach taser, I teach uh, force on force. Uh, we, can, we can continue going on and on. You know, for these classes that we've got, we've got an individual within our agency that teaches such cl classes of how to how to maneuver around vehicles and and shoot through vehicles and whatever it may be, how uh, home uh, entries, you name it. He's got the tactical experience. He's got the training, and uh, we've got that capability right now in our facility. So one, we're going to utilize that. Number two. If the money's given to us, we're going we're gonna to use that money. I know that we've got about $5,000 that we utilize within a detention facility uh, for training. A lot of training's been cut off over the last year or so because they restricted travel. So, you know, with that said, we're going to continue. We're going to continue to train. We're going to continue to utilize what we're doing in-house and expand upon it in-house because that's some of the best training money can buy. We've got the, and, the, and the individual I'm talking about, he's in this room, and he's traveled worldwide utilizing this training and he's brought it right here in Macon County so you know bang for your buck you guys we have to keep pursuing training for officers here in Macon County and talking about the budget the training budget we do have a training budget and the department heads unit heads get together every budget cycle and go over if there's any specialized training that their officers are going to need that we need to budget for outside of that the majority of this training is free to our agency you know if we go we sign up for a class at southwestern that's at no charge to the agency if we sign up for a class at the justice academy that's at no charge to the agency yeah it cost us their their time you know they're on the clock when they go it cost us the fuel and, and the wear and tear on the vehicle but that's at no cost to the agency as far as there is no cost for the class itself and the majority of the law enforcement classes that we get are geared that way now a lot of these specialties like I said that's something we get together every year and we put that into the upcoming budget so that way it's in there to give those officers the opportunity to go get that specialized training if need be could you repeat the question so I make sure I understand it certainly <laughs> If elected, will you increase the training budget to allow for extra training beyond in-service training and be open to implementing any and new updated technology and equipment? Awesome. One of the things that I did back in last year, September, is I, I got the county commissioners to make a proposal to reduce the incoming sheriff's budget. I realize I'm not the most popular guy in the room for that, but nonetheless, I did, and it reduced it by $35,000. So that gives me $35,000 extra in the budget that I want to use for course training. And so we were talking about, Mr. Jones said he's got $5,000, but what could he do with $10,000 as opposed to $5,000? He can do a lot more with that. So I want to utilize that money to, to supplement the training money that we have already. That, in that respect, it would increase the budget. The training budget, not the overall budget, just the training budget. The money all stays the same, and it's up to the sheriff how he spends his money. 
even though he has the line items he has to deal with. But as far as technology goes, I've made several proposals on increasing the technology that we utilize in Macon County. One of which is the video, uh, the video magistrate program. As a, as a program that's being utilized across the state, we're one of 65 counties that have been authorized to utilize this, and it will also help save us money in the long run on, on, when they start utilizing it. We have to make sure we have all the infrastructure in order to do that, that we computers and the cars and things of that nature. I also propose that we bring a drone program to our county. That, can, that is a drone that we can utilize, that we own ourselves, not have access to, but we own ourselves. We have our own people licensed, and we will be able to utilize that to assist in, in a lot of different areas within our county. So I believe in being a proactive sheriff, and I want to make sure that we keep ahead of the trends. And, and to do that, you have to make sure you know what technology is coming, coming around the corner. That's why I brought up the, the uh, de-escalation training. That is, that, is, uh, that is something that's brand new in the state of North Carolina. And I will make sure that we get our deputies out to that training so that we can get this up-to-date training and be proactive in everything that we do. Thank you. Well, first of all, I, I will not commit to increasing the budget for training because the first thing that's going to happen if, if the citizens elect me as sheriff as soon as we go in, we're going to be working off the current budget as it stands. So we're going to have to start going over that budget and seeing exactly what's being spent where within each department of the sheriff's office. So that's going to be the starting point. Well, they're going to have X amount of dollars each supervisor that they have currently that they're using for training. Well, if they ask for an increase in what they've already had in this current budget, they're going to have to sell that to me ultimately. They're going to have to come to me and show me why they need more money for training. If it's something that I, I think is uh, necessary, then I would be comfortable to come to the commissioners and ask them for some taxpayer money to help fund that. But that's where we get to. We're not going to go to the commissioners and ask for taxpayer money unless it's an absolute need. And that goes transitions right over into technology. There's a lot of great things that can be done with technology nowadays, and there's going to be a lot of things coming online as we go. We know how technology is growing day by day. If it's something that would be utilized within our department, that could be a great asset, and we research it, and if I can put together a proposal to sell to the commissioners, then it's a great thing. But I'm not just going to go be asking for money just because it's something cool and fancy and new to come online. It's going to have to be something that benefits the taxpayers because it's their money that we're spending on each and everything that we're talking about tonight. So that's where I stand. If it's something we absolutely need, then yes, I'll put together a proposal. I'll come to the commissioners and I'll stand before them and I'll ask them for the money and present my proposal, basically selling what we need for the sheriff's department. One thing I will fight for will be anything safety-wise. I'll fight to the if my officers need a safety issue. That's one thing in the budget that will always be fought for from this sheriff. I agree with Chris. I, I don't know what the current training budget is, but if there is a need um, to raise that budget, that would be done. Uh, because ultimately, training, it, it boils down to safety. And I'm going to touch on what Derek was saying. There's an officer in the back here to the right that's just unbelievable. And his, his training, his, his experience in uh, tactical uh, firearms is just unbelievable. Uh, to go on to the, uh, the, the video magistrate program, Lord, if you live in Barnetown, you know good and well you ain't gonna get no service down there for that <laughs> that program, Bob. <laughs> Except at the fire department, they have Wi-Fi. <laughs> the new one, but the old one, you you're not you going to. Dave's Creek. Uh, there's more than two. Right. Feel free to to ride around down there, <laughs> and, and and like uh, and like uh, Chris said, safety. Uh, of course, if it's a, a safety a safety concern, absolutely, we'll uh, we'll, we'll definitely. Expand the budget to provide safety for the officers. I'll new out. Okay. It's a new question. You, yeah, you got a brand new question. This is really going to be a good one that you're going to be challenged to answer. <clears throat> the question is Do you feel that there are major gains in efficiency to be obtained within the operation of the Sheriff's Office and Detention Center? Or do you feel that there are only minor gains to be made? I, I think, you know, talking about efficiency, I think there's changes that need to be made. 
And I think those changes that I'm wanting to make is going to increase the efficiency of your sheriff's office tremendously in, in certain areas, whether that be in the narcotics work that we're wanting to do here in our county or in the jail setting or an investigation setting. There are changes currently being done um, just like uh, with our DARE program. We're, we're getting ready to certify four new DARE officers here in Macon County. So we're constantly evolving, we're constantly changing, we're constantly trying to get ahead of the curve. Um, you know, going back to the drone program, I do want to touch on that just briefly. We currently have a part-time officer here in, in Macon County that's retired from North Carolina Wildlife. He works part-time for us. He's also part of National, National Missing and Exploited Children's Program, NICMIC, out of Washington, D.C. He's part-time for us. He provides us with two drones right here in Macon County. That's at no cost to the taxpayers. We have two drone pilots that work for the Sheriff's Office right now that are capable of taking those, those up in the air if need be. This is brand new. It's, it's not something that we've had for years. Um, this is something that's come down the pike in the last little bit. Talk, going back, uh, talking about uh, technology and stuff, a big piece of equipment that I'm wanting to implement is a body scanner in the jail. You know, we, go, we talk about the drug problem, we talk about this, we talk about that, but what we're having and what we're seeing and what we've seen over the years is drugs are getting into our facility. We have to stop that. We can do all the rehabilitation we want on the backside with no wrong door, with team challenge, which I'm a, I'm a big fan of, but we have to implement things that are going to officer safety. You know, we're getting things taken into the jail. We need to worry about officer, officer safety. And I think that the body scanner is going to be a big, big way of increasing officer safety and preventing, preventing illegal things from getting down into our jail setting. A lot of things I've looked at as far as efficiency goes, I think the department could use a reorganization to make it less redundant, less cumbersome, making sure that we have the right number of supervisors, the number of people that we have, the appropriate amount of uh, rank versus what we already have. I want to make sure that when I look at this, that, that we have what we need, no more, no less. I want to make sure that when, when uh, we have an organization that we don't have too many, too many uh, say, part-time uh, people sitting around twiddling their thumbs. And again, I'm not saying anybody does that. I'm just saying I want to make, take a look at that and make sure that, I, that we, are, we have the right organization based on our size and, 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 our, and our mission. It's important that our mission is accomplished. So I want to make sure that we have um, all, the tech, all, the, all the people in place and the technology that is necessary to get that job done. And that's going to, the technology is what's going to make it more efficient. And one of the, like, like Mr. Bryson says, uh, some kind of scanner at the jail, that's exactly one of the things that I would like to see too. Uh, if we happen to have an extra magnetometer, we have three of them at the courthouse here, and we could actually move one down from the fourth floor, put it over to the jail, and uh, use the two at the front and back door. So we can go over to courthouse security later. But uh, that'd be one way to uh, save our money so we don't have to buy a new one. But that would at least do some of that uh, as far as uh, making sure that we don't have people getting into jail and stuff they shouldn't have. So I want to make sure that, that, that our people are trying to do their job, that we have the right number of people there to do it. And I want to make sure that, uh, that uh, our, our, our supervisors are, are uh, at the right number that we have to have for that number of people. Thank you. Yes, this is what my campaign is built around is a uh, change. Um, there has to be change at all. And, it, and one thing I want to make clear because it's been tried to, to be brought across that I'm against the officers that works in the department because I talk about leadership change. I talk about different things that need to be done in the department. It's not about the officers. I'm willing to work with the other officers and even the ones that are laughing at me right now. That, you know, I'm willing to work with them also. One thing that came out uh, last week that was interesting at the Latino meeting that all of us were at was the fact that it was admitted that there was has been times where there's been domestic violence orders that have been taken out by victims of domestic violence that has not gotten served and expired. Now, we know statistically that most of these victims are going to be women. Right? We know in most domestic violence cases it's the women that get in these situations and it gets bad enough they have to go get a domestic violence order because they're scared for their safety. 
uh, there's no other way to say it except it's unacceptable to ever have one domestic violence order that, that expires because it did get served. Unless you've got a very good reason this guy made it to California and you didn't get to it. Maybe you got an excuse on that point, but if it's happened more than once, there's a problem. And there again, we've got to beef up the domestic violence unit. Uh, we gotta, if we've if we got to add more to that to make sure that we're taking care of the victims of domestic violence, that's what we got to do. I don't think that's a hard sell to the commissioners if we have to add people to our domestic violence unit. But one way or the other, that's going to be one of the other things that's going to be looked at very quickly as soon as I go in because we, we can't allow the possibility of a victim getting hurt because this is one of the few avenues that a victim has is through the domestic violence orders. I agree. Change is needed. It is. Um, it's time for new blood, and I think we need to stick. <clears throat> there, there's got to be accountability, folks. There has to be a chain of command. There has to be structure. Plain and simple. And we also, Bob said he's going to touch on it in a minute. I'm sure that's probably a question here in a moment. But this courthouse needs to be secured. It does. Um, and to, there also needs to be a, a domestic violence officer. We once had one. Uh, she no longer works for us, but we do. We need a dedicated officer to deal with strictly the domestic violence issues that arise. And there, there are a lot of domestic issues in Macon County. Um, thank you. Technology efficiency, day late, dollar short. Um, I mean it in a bad way. When you're dealing when you're dealing with three or four different things and you're trying to enhance about courthouse security, you're trying to enhance about security within the jail. Uh, I know we've heard about the kiosks and oh we just done that, we've done that out of the blue. When I took over the jail back in 2018, it's been a three year process. COVID hit. Uh, stuff got shipped to Alabama when it should be, it should have been shipped to us. Uh, kiosks have been installed. You got video visitation for the inmates and their families that can stay at their homes now. Okay, mail scanning possibilities. We scan their mail in and they read it on the kiosk. No longer contraband going downstairs. The other thing that we've been looking at three years ago, businesses out of South Carolina, are these detectors, the body scan detectors, for the back dock going into the detention center. But how in the world can I come in and ask for $180,000 for one thing, $400,000 for another, because these things aren't cheap. Uh, I, know, I know that these body scanners and I know that uh, Brent and I, and we've looked at it when we were around different courthouses, looking at how to secure the courthouse. These things aren't cheap. Then you got to take about manpower. Then you got to talk about training. So things that we have done and things that we need to expand upon is something daily, you know. And we've looked into this. There's been a lot of things that's come in. Spent a lot of a lot of money that we already had pre-existing. Uh, the next thing that was supposed to be on the plan was those detectors, the body detectors coming through the back door of the jail. It's already in the works. It's been in the works. Uh, the courthouse, yes, we need to secure it. We need it. We need personnel. Uh, we're three, four people short here, right here at the courthouse. I know we're two or three short in investigations. I'm too short in the detention center. So, you know, there's always areas that we need to eat and look at and look at and, and progress. So, if elected, we're going to continue to do that, and we're going to we're going to do that for the betterment of the citizen, the betterment of the agency. <coughs> Did I start that question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah you did. You started. <laughs> okay. Here comes question number 14. So, since you started it, Mr. Cook, you get to start this one. All right. All right. This is the question. The Macon County Sheriff's Office policies and procedures were recently updated by Smith Rogers and Aldridge, PLLC. Fancy, fancy letters for an attorney's office who represent a large number of law enforcement officers in North Carolina and have partners who were legal advisors to the North Carolina Justice Academy. If elected, do you plan on using taxpayers' dollars to change current policies and procedures? And if so, what would you change? Good question. I actually have a copy of the policy and procedures, and so I've been going through them. And I've noticed that they do have an attorney who goes through all these policies and procedures. But there are some policies and procedures that aren't there. For example, in, how to handle in, uh, um, informants. There's a, there's a, that should be a policy all by itself. One of the things that I plan on doing to make that happen, to change the policies and procedures, is I'm going to go through the DOJ, DOJ in North Carolina 
and I'm going to inquire about the accreditation process. And what that is is you make, they have already a set of policies and procedures that are standard throughout the state of North Carolina, and that are accepted. They're tried and true in court, and they've been and they've been proven every, everywhere they're used. Now, what we have to do is we have to make, we have to modify them a little bit for Macon County. I don't have to spend a lot of money to do that. And if there is money involved when, when it comes to trying to get a credit, then that's going to, that, there's grants available for that. And I'm going to be able to utilize people like, like Mr. Jones to write grants to be able to get that money to do that. Now, we need to make sure we have policy and procedures. And the reason we have to have them and they have to be covered in things that we may not have to deal with right now is because when we do have to deal with it, it's too late. I want to make sure I'm a proactive sheriff and that I make sure that our policies and procedures cover you at, from lawsuits. Right now, we have to worry about being sued for every little thing that we come across. And if we don't have something that covers this as far as a policy procedure, then guess who's sued personally? I am, as a sheriff. So I want to make sure that we cover the things that we would normally have to cover. And I can do that without very, very much cost at all, if at all, to the, to the taxpayers. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm sure there will be changes to the policy and procedures. Um, that would be another thing, just like the budget, that you go in the sheriff, you're going to have to sit down and go through what the current policy and procedures are. Um, the two things that has to qualify, obviously it has to meet the legal standard, but it's also going to have to meet the standards of me if I'm elected as the new sheriff. Uh, policy and procedure coming from a military background is absolutely crucial. If you set policy and procedure as the leader, as the sheriff of that office, like, say, like we had the discussion the other night about body cameras. What's your policy on a body camera? Does it stay on all the time? Do you stay, does it stay on for a road deputy when he's just making a, a traffic stop or, or out on a call, uh, domestic violence call or whatever? You, just, you have to have all these situations from each department within that office. You have to have the policy and procedure in place of what you expect of that officer, how to handle each situation. Because, like Mr. Cook said, if, if something happens out here, God forbid they get in a situation with a, a shooting, well then it, it ends up in court or whatever, and they sit down and they say, well your policy and procedure doesn't cover this. You don't even have this or it doesn't cover it fully. That comes back to the sheriff. You should have had a policy and procedure in place to cover each situation. And, and that covers you, that covers the deputy, the officer, and the whole department, and ultimately the county, because it will cut back on the lawsuits because you, you had the policy and procedure in place and ultimately at that point it's up to the officer or the employee to go over what the policy and standard is that you set in place for the department. So yeah, I foresee that there will be changes. I don't think it'll be a whole, you know, you won't be rewriting the whole policy and procedure manual, but there will be changes made in that and working with the uh, attorneys to make those changes. A lot of people worked hard and long on the current policy and procedures that we have now. A lot of man hours went into that. Um, I've got a copy of it as well. I, I mean, I've went through it. It's probably about 100, 100 125 pages long. It's, it's substantial. Uh, do I, can I sit, stand here before you and say I'll make any changes? I, I don't know. I don't know if I will or not. Uh, but I do know one thing. It's imperative that we keep um, Smith and Rogers on board. Uh, you know, I work downstairs civil process. I deal with e executions and things of that nature. No, I don't kill nobody. Executions, uh, rid of possession, stuff like that. And I'm constantly on the phone. I have a lot. I have him on speed dial. I call him quite often. Myself and uh, Captain Wishon, we're constantly with him. So I think it's imperative that we, unfortunately, spend your tax money because that is, other than the jail, that's the biggest liability the sheriff the sheriff department has. And what a lot of folks don't know that the sheriff is reliable for. Courthouse, uh, it's courthouse security, civil process, and the jail. That's the only thing he's required law by law to do. He don't have to answer your call for breaking and entering or your domestic. He don't have to answer those things, but those are the three things that he has to do. So I think it's imperative that we keep Smith Rogers on board and, and continue with, with their services. As, uh, as Brent stated, <clears throat> Smith Rogers has been with us for several years now. And uh, there's no way in the world that I would ever 
uh, get rid of Smith Rogers. That's probably some of the best, wisest investment that we've made in the last 10 years. Now, will the policies and procedures need to be reviewed? Absolutely. Each and every year, we have to review the policies and procedures. I've got to send a copy of policies and procedures to the health department so they know what our medication uh, or uh, medical plan is yearly. It has to be updated. It has to be gone through by the not only the health director, but the, uh, the physician himself, Dr. Dewhurst, and it's sent back whether he approves it or not. <coughs> on the uh, patrol, on the uh, law side of it, it's got to be reviewed each and every year. So with that said, uh, it's going to have to be reviewed. It's going to have to be signed, sealed, delivered by whoever you elect to be the next sheriff. That's unanimous uh, because when that stuff gets sent in, and I know, I know on the detention side because I oversee it. I oversaw those 75 policies with the assistance of, of my subordinates. Those 75 policies have to be signed off on by the sheriff approved by the medical director and approved by the Department of Health and Human Services in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. So there is a lot that goes into it. Each and every year it will be reviewed. Each and every year it will be either approved or disapproved, but we will not get rid of Smith Rogers. Not a whole lot left to say. Um, I can tell you, along with Derek, Brent might have had a hand in that, I'm not sure, but before Smith Rogers came along, you took unit heads, department heads, and whatever policies fell under them, the unit heads wrote the policies for the agency. I know, I wrote the SWAT policy, I wrote the canine policy, I wrote other policies within the agency along with our administration. So having Smith Rogers on board, having a, an expert in the field of writing policies for agencies, and they, they you know, they, they're contracted with very large agencies in Western North Carolina, many agencies across the state. And just like Brent said, you know, I use them on a regular basis. If I'm out here in a situation and I'm not exactly sure um, what to do or how to handle it, because there's no situation we run into that's the same, and that's a fact. Everything we encounter on a daily basis is something different. So there's times that I'm not quite sure exactly how to handle it. So to keep our agency out of a, a lawsuit, and to save taxpayer dollars, because I'm telling you, if we end up in a lawsuit, that's going to cost a lot more than what we're paying Smith Rogers to be that legal counsel for us. So we're able to call them from the roadside at 2 o'clock in the morning. We're able to call Smith Rogers and get a phone call back within five minutes. So if you're out there on a call, I've been out on a standoff before and had to call Smith Rogers. So they are a service that is tried and true, and they are worth their weight in gold. And by all means, I will be keeping Smith Rogers around. And our policy is something that we have to look at every year because you have changes in the law, you have case laws that come down the pike that might affect policy, so you have to update those policies on a regular basis to make sure that you are protecting everybody's rights. Thank you. I've already answered. You, you already did. Okay, here we go. This is the last question. You get to start it. You ready for this one? And I want a truthful answer. This, this whole room wants a truthful answer. So stand up tall. And the question is this. And don't let nobody laugh about this. If you were not running for this position, who would you vote for and why? Which one of these other four would you vote for? <laughs> That's a question that's here. I mean, I didn't, I'm just reading it. I just need everybody to hear it. That's all I want. <laughs> uh, that's very easy, quick, and simple. I would vote for Brent Holbrooks in a heartbeat if I wasn't running. And that's because I feel like he's got the best at heart. Um, I know his track record. I know his history. Um, we grew up together. We grew up down in Barntown, Iowa area. I know where his heart lies. And... I know his history as far as his, how he has conducted himself throughout his life and compared to what I see, that would be the one that I would vote for. Simple. Mr. Holbrook, the man of the minute here. Ooh, right now, you're number one. You are number one, anyhow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to play the fifth, honestly. I, you know... We got some great guys sitting up here. I thank the world of all of them. You know, me and Bob, we've butted heads via Facebook a few times. Well, 
I don't know if we call butt button heads, but from what I know of him, he's he's a good guy. The reason I, I pointed you out, Bob, because I don't know you personally. I grew up with these three guys. I've known them for 20 plus years. I've known Chris for 40. Um, I would cast my vote for each one of you. I would. Uh, that's that's as good as it's going to get. I've got two minutes. I want everybody here to know uh, something else about me. I see a couple pastors in here. Heart for Families. It's a Christian organization that puts emphasis on marriages. 70% divorce rate in emergency services. I want to change that. And why I uh, pointed this out is I've been persecuted by these fake account people on Facebook. And I hope you're here and I'm calling you out. Thank you. My God, it's bigger than you folks. Whoever the fake account people. Well, I'm glad I'm glad he said that because you know obviously everybody wants to crack on your family and and what you've done and what have you, and uh, it's 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 not going to be tolerated. But uh, you know I've been drugged through the same thing, and uh, in all honesty, I think each and every one of these individuals has something different to bring to the table. You know, I, I like certain things about Brent, I like certain things about Clay, I like certain things about Bob, and I like things about Chris. Uh, like I said from the get-go, I told you earlier, I respect each and every one of them. You know, can I tell you that I can cast my vote for each and every one of them? That's, that'd be a lie. So, I'll be the first one to tell you if that's the case, then I'll mark somebody in. Uh, I'm going to write Tony Ash in today. And, uh, you know, he just got retired and he's going to jump right back in it. But in all honesty, you know, if I told you I'd be voting for one or the other, I, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. So the fact of the matter remains is, you know, I stand by what Brent had to say there. And uh, I will not tolerate it. I've not said the first word about anybody's family. And, uh, and I've taken enough of my own. I've shut people down. When they've started talking, I've walked away. And uh, it's, it's sad that it's come to that. We've got three weeks away. This is behind us, you know. And, uh, and that's, all, that's all I've got to say about that. <laughs> that's all i got to say. <laughs> Guys, you know, I, I agree with, with everything that's been said. You know, I don't know who I'd vote for if I wasn't running myself. Um, I think I would have to do like all of you are going to have to do. You're going to have to sit back. You're going to have to analyze everything that's been said here tonight. Please go on social media, go on Facebook. We all have sheriff accounts on Facebook. Check out our account, see what we have to offer. Not everything we have to offer has been covered here tonight. So I'm not going to answer that question. I work with these two over here and have for many years. But I don't know who I'd vote for at the end of the day if I wasn't running. So make sure, check us out. Go on our Facebook profiles. And you know, that's something Brent touched on. Facebook could be such a wonderful tool here in Macon County to get the word out, to talk about our passion, what we want to do with the future of Macon County. But instead, you've got so many naysayers on there. You've got Facebook profiles that are constantly attacking candidates up here, all of us, and belittling us, spreading lies, spreading rumors. Guys, this, this is crazy. Um, I remember years past under Sheriff Robert Holland, where it was smooth sailing during campaign season. But I'm telling you, the last two, the more social media becomes a thing, it's so easy for people to sit behind a keyboard and become a keyboard warrior. You know, and there's fake profiles everywhere this go around. I know of at least six right now just standing here. But please go on our social media sites, check out who we are, read about us, study up on us, pray about it, and ask the good Lord who's the best person to lead this agency forward into the future. Very well said, guys. Here, I'm probably the most loved guy on Facebook that anybody's ever seen. <laughs> what? <laughs> Listen, I'm very prolific on social media. I use that a lot because I want to reach as many people as I can. I have never, never, never posted under a fake name. Never. I have never attacked a person's family. I never will do that. All right. I do point out differences between myself and these four other candidates. That's what, the, that's what elections are about. I will do that. But I will tell you that everybody brings something different to the table, whether it's Chris Browning or any of these people, any of these guys. We all bring something different. And I'm like these guys. I don't think I can pick somebody right now. Besides that, who you vote for is one of our God-given private rights in this country. Amen. And, I, and I don't have to publicly say who I'm going to vote for, no matter what. Right, because that change that can also change as I as we've all seen over the last last year today they might be his supporter today they're mine tomorrow 
There he is. All right. It just depends on, on what we say at that particular moment that they agree with. All of us have put out good policy procedures, and I agree with these guys, all these guys. Go to our websites. I can say go to our Facebook page, but by now, after a year, it is pretty difficult to navigate. There's a lot of garbage you have to get through to, to get through that. So what I suggest is you go to our website. My website, for example, is cookforsheriff.com. And if you want to know what I said about drugs, click on the drug tab. If you want to see what I said about courthouse security, click on that. Or reorganization, click on that. It's a lot easier to navigate that way rather than... Uh, flip through all the, the, the Facebook pages, which can be very frustrating. Trust me. I appreciate all your attention time. Thank you. Yes, sir. I think I'm the only one that answered, right? Yeah. <laughs> you are. Yeah. You're the only one. You're supposed to be honest. <laughs> That's what makes the difference, because I can't say what I feel. How do you know they weren't honest? <coughs> yes. They didn't, yeah, we're they didn't honest. name the candidate for a yeah. He asked me to be honest about who I would choose who I would vote for. I'm not saying what they said they were not. But they wasted. He asked me, please be honest. <coughs> Folks, I think we've pretty well covered everything this evening. These are the candidates. You've got uh, two and a, three weeks, I guess it is now, to go home and think about this. Uh, ask as many questions as you want. Call them on the telephone. Go on Facebook. Two, two months. Two. No, I thought you said we've got a two-minute closing. Closing all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do, but we can if we can hurry it up at all. <laughs> if anybody's got any last minutes. Zip them up real quick. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Folks, you've sat here tonight and you've listened to, to all the candidates and what, what we've had to say. And pretty much, we're all on the same page. We have the same ideas and goals for Macon County. <laughs> um, well, with that being said, there's not one candidate up here that's ever been sheriff before. It's the right person for the job, and I'll be that person's me. Uh, <laughs> so when you go to vote, and you walk in there on that little flimsy desk that they give you to fill in your chad, ask yourself this. Who's been clean through the whole, this whole process? Who's been humble? And I had a preacher once say, if you call yourself humble, you're not really humble. Um, and who's been approachable? And again, that's me. With all that being said, throughout this campaign, I've heard me, 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 I, I, I. I've done this, I've done that, and so on and so forth. I've done it too. I'm guilty of it as well. But I want everybody out here to know, and on Facebook land, that this process this this position is not about me it's about you it's about us and most important it's about our kids thank you for all for coming out tonight as brent said there number one you guys have taken that extra step to come out and hear what we've got to say today each and every one of us we all share the same goal and that's to take this county to the next level you know i always preach about education experience and leadership and I believe that you've got to lead from the front if you're not willing to do things that your men and women do for you daily you're not a leader when you go and you look to vote as Brent said there you know there's a lot of things you need to weigh in you need to weigh in you know are they a leader do they have the ideas do they have the experience do they have the education to go forward pray about it this is a serious this is a very serious election over the last 20 years you know we've We've, we've elected the same sheriff. He's done a great job over the last 20 years. We've got commissioner races that are up. Very serious races here. Elect people that you know is going to take us into the future. That's going to do for the betterment of not just one, but for all of Macon County. It's not about Republicans. It's not about unaffiliated. It's not about Democrats. It's about all. I've always been involved with the youth. I've always been involved with the elderly. You've always been able to come see me at the office. I've seen a lot of you come by and see me, talk to me. Wish us luck. I thank you for that. Continue to pray for us. You know, pray for these guys as well. Uh, they're going through the same thing that I am. My family's going through. I love each and every one of them, whether they know it or not. But uh, God bless you. Again, Jones 2022. We start May, April the 28th on Thursday, go through May 17th. Macon County, I love you. Guys, there's a lot of negative things that's been said over the course of this race. And I just want to point out some interesting facts, um, statistics that came out from the SBI 
um, through the Uniform Crime Reporting Program for the 2020 year. Now we get those statistics in the fall of the year, so we got them around uh, August, September of last year. Um, 21 statistics won't come out till about August, September of this year. But per statistics, Macon County crime rate is less than the state average. Their violent crime rate is less than the state average. Their property crime rate is less than the state average. This is fact. Macon County has one of the best crime rates in North Carolina. One of the lowest crime rates in Western North Carolina. So to me, that's important. And that's something that the three of us that currently work for the Sheriff's Office, we're a part of that. We're a part of helping Macon County to have one of the lowest crime rates in Western North Carolina. I want to continue this trend. Uh, guys, we're, we're all up here for the same common purpose. We're wanting to become the next sheriff of Macon County. It's up for you to decide which one's got the best policies, which one's got the best practices, which one's got the best ideas of moving that agency forward. I feel it's me. I've been humbled to be where I'm at. I'm led by the Father, my family, and my, my career. Um, but guys, I'm in this. I feel led to be where I'm at. I'm a man of truth. My father raised me a man's only as good as his word. If I tell you something, I promise I'm going to follow through with it. I feel like over the years, we've gotten away from black and white, right and wrong. We've blurred those lines a little too much. There's too much of a gray area out there. And we need to get back to some of the basics of being black and white again. Guys, Clay Bryson, running for sheriff 2022. I'll be honored and humbled to have your support in this upcoming primary. Thank you. We've all listened to the, the, the ideas that we put forth, and there's been a lot of good ideas on, on all of our parts that we put forward today. One of the things that I want to make sure everybody knows is that I'm going to be as proactive as a sheriff that, that we ever have had. I want to make sure that we move forward in not only uh, our training practices and our policy practices, but just the way we do things in Macon County in general. It's great that we have the lowest crime rate. But that doesn't mean a thing to the person whose house got broke into that tries to call and doesn't feel like they get a response. Doesn't mean a thing to them. But it does mean overall that we have a better environment and that's great. We need that. We need to continue that trend. But there are a lot of things driving the dissatisfaction that we have that I've come across in the county. And that has to do with the, what they feel is a lack of transparency and a lack of response. And I will take care of that. I will make sure that we do that. And while, while Mr. Hol Mr. Holbrook, he did say there's a lot of I, I, me, me, me. Well, that's because as a sheriff, it is I, it is me. It's part of a team, but we're the ones that have to make it work. We have to lead from the front. I am used to leading from the front. I have done that my whole time, whether it's in the military or as a police officer. You don't have to have a sergeant's rank to lead a squad. You can be the leader of your squad without having to be a sergeant's rank. And so I will make sure that, that we, have, we have a proactive leadership in our sheriff's office. Um, I appreciate all the time that I've, that I've spent throughout the last year with the county, with the citizens of the county. Even today, I spent an hour or two out skiing and talking to a family out there. And before I got here, I was called by two other uh, people that had some questions. So it's, it's a matter of being uh, accessible and ready to answer questions when people call you. And I will be that person that you call me, and if I don't answer the phone myself, one of my staff will answer whatever your question is. I will make sure that you get what you need out of your sheriff's office. They've done a great job so far, but I want to take it to the next level. Again, I'm Bob Cook. I'm your candidate yeah, sheriff. Thank you. Thank you. One thing to add to the uh, SBI crime statistics, if the great citizens of Macon County do elect me as sheriff and I'm able to uphold the promises that I've made to the citizens, and if I start making more arrests, the crime rate's going to start showing that it's going up in Macon County because that's what it's based on. You start making more drug arrests, whatever category that that falls in within the SBI, whenever we put it in the computer, it goes out to them. That's how it's going to show within the, the system. So that's just something I'm telling to watch. If I'm able to uphold my promise, it's going to go up. So, um, the main thing that we've talked about all night with is leadership throughout this whole thing. Everything we've talked about, all the issues, is 
But most importantly, to get away from all the, the law enforcement talk and everything else, the most important thing in my life that's ever happened all was back when I was saved at 13 and accepted Jesus. That right there is what makes a leader if you take him along with you and you rely on him and you pray for his guidance, his leadership throughout everything you're doing in your life, really. But especially when you get in those hard situations that sheriff's going to, any sheriff's going to be faced with very difficult situations, decisions he has to make quickly, or decisions he has to work on. So that's most important. And also, uh, the next thing would be my family, my daughter, and uh, my family. So uh, that's where I stand. I think we pretty well covered all the issues. I appreciate everyone that uh, all these meetings we've been going to here lately. Yeah. We, we've been through a, a lot of questions and answering. It's, it's been good. It's been good to meet. We, we had a great meeting in Nauta last night. We had a full house. And it was great. So thank you. Thank you. First of all, folks, I want to thank y'all for coming. Y'all made this a success. You guys, I appreciate y'all taking time out of your day to come. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Vote on the Hush. <laughs> Basically, the FOP, we've been established here in Mike County for 20 years. If you'd like more information on it, see Mike Langley back here in the back. He can give you more information how y'all could help with what we do and explain what we do. And again, gentlemen, I appreciate it. Thank These guys you, ask you to pray for them, let's pray for all law enforcement. Okay? Yeah. That's right. All right. Thank you, guys.